Chapter twenty nine of Anglo American Memories by George Washburn Smalley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty nine Annexing Canada Lady Aberdeen Lady Minto the first person with whom i heard of the american immigration into canada was sir wilfrid laurier he told me it had begun quietly a few american farmers drifting across the border in search of better and cheaper land than could be had at home there was no sound of drum or trumpet these men had nothing to do with the talk of annexation they had no political object their object was agricultural only that and nothing more it is possible enough that the reputed riches of the northwest province of canada had something to do with the policy if it can be called a policy of the american annexationists desiring to fire the hearts of the farmers in illinois and minnesota who saw the yield of their wheat lands diminishing yearly it seems never to have occurred to the politicians that the farmers were quite capable of looking after their own interests and that it was cheaper to buy land than to make war for it the movement had at the time of this conversation in nineteen o two been going on for years beginning by scores it had risen to hundreds yearly then thousands sir wilfrid computed that there were altogether some fifty or sixty thousand american settlers in the canadian northwest and that the yearly exodus from the states had reached six thousand but does that not raise or threaten to raise a political issue oh it is much too soon to think of that nevertheless i imagine sir wilfrid did think of it and it may have been present to lord grey's mind when he launched his memorable declaration at the waldorf hotel two years later now the number of americans who are moving northward and acquiring canadian soil is computed at a hundred thousand yearly or more the political difficulty if there were one would seem to be met by the canadian law allowing aliens to hold land but requiring them to become canadians at the end of three years i am told there is such a law but i do not know in truth the political difficulty has never outgrown manageable limits there has always been more or less tall talk about annexing canada eloquent phrases have been heard one continent one flag or the stars and stripes from the gulf of mexico to the arctic circle but no party has taken up this cry one newspaper in new york the sun did for a time preach annexation the sun is a journal which does not disdain sensations and has taught its readers to expect them and from time to time fulfils the expectations it excites the editor at that time was mr paul dana son of the mr charles a dana who made the sun a powerful journal mr paul dana started a society to promote the acquisition of canada the capital of the society was a hundred and twenty five thousand dollars or twenty five thousand pounds that was the sum which mr paul dana and his friends thought sufficient or were able to raise if they did raise it to sever from the british empire a dominion larger than the united states without alaska capable in military opinion of self-defence but in any case with the military and naval power of great britain behind it mr paul dana however did not pursue matters to the bitter end he has ceased to be editor of the sun and canada remains british i do not know whether his annexation society is still in existence but the american appetite for canada never keen has grown duller still men's minds turn to other things the philippines and hawaii and puerto rico and the defence of the pacific coast are more than enough to occupy our attention the senate itself has grown tractable and on the chief points of difference an agreement has been reached where five years ago no agreement seemed possible two years after sir wilfrid laurier became prime minister the somewhat agitated and perhaps agitating governor-generalship of lord aberdeen came to an end 
i suppose the cause of the troubled waters on which that particular ship of state was tossed was not to be found wholly or mainly in lord aberdeen himself but in the multitudinous energies of lady aberdeen her convictions were strong her zeal was continuous her certainty of being in the right was a certainty she shared with her sex or with all those women who think public affairs their proper sphere she had many admirable qualities and a courage which shrank from no adventure merely because it was an adventure her zeal in the cause of home rule for ireland is well known it had been shown in dublin it was shown now in ottawa it crossed the border and hung out a flag in chicago in the chicago exhibition or as it was officially called the world's columbian exposition in eighteen ninety three there was among other attractions an irish village this village lady aberdeen took under her patronage and over it she hoisted an irish flag of the kind in which the home rule heart rejoices a flag with the harp but without the crown if lady aberdeen had done this as a private individual it could hardly have been allowed to pass but she did it as wife of the governor-general of the dominion of canada there were official remonstrances and the flag was lowered against an indiscretion of that kind may be set many useful and charitable enterprises begun or encouraged by this lady in ottawa and all over canada she is kindly remembered there and her visits to canada since lord aberdeen ceased to be governor-general have been welcomed but there are many stories of her crusading spirit besides the ones i have told and i suppose the canadians really like to live a more peaceful life than they were allowed to when lady aberdeen ruled over them lord minto succeeded lord aberdeen sir wilfrid laurier was prime minister during the whole of lord minto's term and mr chamberlain was secretary for the colonies down to the last year i suppose it may be remarked that seldom have three great officials worked in a harmony more complete than did these three it can hardly be necessary to say anything of mr chamberlain except this that his masterfulness never made itself felt in canada in such a way as to weaken but always in such a way as to strengthen the tie between the motherland and the colony his imperialism took account of the dominion as well as of the empire it took equal account for all purposes it was under this strong hand that canada felt her independence perhaps for the first time completely safeguarded between lord minto and sir wilfrid laurier there was on all subjects an understanding that is not the same thing as saying they never differed which would be absurd but they had before them the same high objects and they pretty well agreed as to the means of attaining them the relations between government house and parliament house where the prime minister had his headquarters were cordial frank unrestrained and delightful that there should be relations of that kind between the representative of the crown and the representative of the dominion is of equal advantage to the crown and to the dominion they have not always existed but there seems every reason to believe they will exist in the future as they did in lord minto's time and as they do now that lord grey speaks for the sovereign and sir wilfrid laurier is still the trusted prime minister of a dominion which has grown too great to be called a colony as i have mentioned lady aberdeen i may say a word though for a different reason about lady menton who for six years was the idol of ottawa and of the whole dominion if ever there was an example of tact and felicity in the discharge of the duties that fall to the wife of a governor-general lady minto was that example what need be added except that the statement is not a compliment but a testimony the canadian press has paid its tribute and there are other tributes one is that in quebec and toronto the capital of the french roman catholic province and the capital of the british protestant province lady minto was equally popular and equally beloved in a very literal but strictly correct and conventional sense it may be said that she was a power in the dominion the receptions at government house were very interesting 
perhaps sometimes curious as an example of democracy undergoing a social evolution in all the commonwealths beyond the seas the same process i presume may be studied when lady carrington issued three thousand invitations to a reception at government house in sydney the limit had perhaps been reached for the time there can be no such throng at government house in ottawa because it is not large enough perhaps it is not quite large enough for the dignity of the dominion in these days of its amazing growth and ever-increasing importance but ottawa though a flourishing city is not a great city it is a compromise capital the middle term in which the rivalries of quebec on the one hand and toronto on the other found a means of peace on neutral and central ground end of chapter twenty nine Chapter Thirty of Anglo-American Memories by George Washburn Smalley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirty: Two Governors General, Lord Minto and Lord Grey. Lord Minto has now passed from the great post of Governor General of the Dominion to the still greater Vice Royalty of India, but I apprehend it will be long before his reign in Canada is forgotten possibly the canadians might not use and may not like the word rain they are a susceptible as well as a great people they are jealous of their liberties which are in no danger and of the word american to which they have some claim overshadowed though it be by their greater neighbour on the south i have seen more instances than one of canadian sensitiveness of which i will take the simplest having to pay for a purchase in an ottawa shop i asked the shopkeeper whether he would take an american banknote he answered with a flushed face we consider our money as much american as yours we have the same right as you to the name american oh by all means but what do you call our money united states bills and what do you call me but to that simple question he had no answer ready and i rather imagine the time has come or is coming when the canadian may be as proud of the name which identifies him with the northern half of the continent as we are of the adjective we have to share more or less with others i never heard of a mexican calling himself an american but i believe the latin races to the south too and forget sometimes to put south before it lord mento was governor-general while mr chamberlain was colonial secretary a period of transition of imperial transition to which mr chamberlain led the way nobody has ever forgotten his adjuration to all englishmen to think imperially as i remember canada during several visits she was at that time more inclined to think independently not that any party in the dominion meditated a secession from the empire but there was a pretty distinct notion and claim of colonial autonomy canada came first as canada and not as a part of the empire the moment when imperial considerations first became dominant in the canadian mind was a moment of the boer war there it is that lord minto's name becomes indissolubly allied with the dominion his share in that great transaction of the canadian contingent to south africa has never i think been fully understood by the british public nor could it ever be if the matter were left to him he was never a man to advertise himself or his deeds i dare say he will not like my telling the story though i shall tell it only as it was told to me and the teller had nothing to do with government house it was for a while doubtful whether canada would send troops there was i am told an uncertain feeling about the militia organization then on a different footing from the present there were awkward stories of corruption and inefficiency it was doubted whether a force officered and equipped in conditions then existing would do credit to the dominion there were hesitations on other grounds but when finally a levy was voted lord minto who had taken no part in the discussion and could take none 
availed himself of his authority as governor-general and of his experience as a soldier and gave his personal attention to the organization of the contingent it was stated to me much more strongly than that and my informant seemed to doubt whether lord minto did not exceed or at least strain his prerogatives as representative of the crown if he did so much the better the english have ever liked a servant in high place who was not afraid of responsibilities but for my purpose it is enough to say that lord minto took an active part in these momentous preparations i think no officer was appointed without his sanction no contract for supplies entered into which he did not approve no arrangement of any kind made but upon his initiative or with his express consent the result was that the canadian forces reached africa a body of soldiers fit for the field not as a mere aggregation of men food for powder england knows and all the world knows what service they did there were no better troops of the kind perhaps not many of any kind better adapted for the work they had to do and for coping with such an enemy as the boers they did more than their contract called for in the field they builded better than they knew they made it plain to all men that the country which had sent such troops as these many thousands of miles beyond the seas to the relief of the imperial forces of great britain was itself an integral and indispensable part of the empire whereas if they had failed or only half succeeded they would have done little good to the british arms in south africa and none at all to the imperialism of which canada to-day is a bulwark and if this is a true account as i believe it to be of the way in which these two great results were brought about the credit of them belongs more to lord minto than to any other man i do not offer this as an explanation of the regard in which lord minto was held it could not be an explanation because it was not generally known there were other reasons at the top of which i should put his common sense his sincerity and of course that devotion to duty which every governor-general is presumed to possess which in him was conspicuous everybody liked him nobody doubted him he made the interests of canada his own he traversed that vast territory from end to end again and again he held a court not in ottawa only but in quebec in halifax in toronto and in that far north where canada touches alaska and the chief harvest of the soil is gold his five years term came to an end but the colonial office and parliament house and the people of canada wished him to stay on and so the five years became six a period on which to look back with pride canada is again fortunate in her governor-general and in his relations with those who mould public opinion on the american side of the border i imagine it may not be known in england how he first conquered the respect and good will of the americans it was at a dinner of some five hundred or six hundred people at the waldorf hotel in new york in the course of his short speech lord grey referred with a plainness unusual in those exalted regions to what had been said in times past about the possible absorption of canada by the united states but now observed the governor-general there is no more reason for discussing the annexation of canada by the united states than for discussing the annexation of the united states by canada it was a straight hit from the shoulder but the audience rose to it and cheered him as i had heard no englishman cheered in new york before that time he became in a moment a great figure filling the public eye he delivered his tremendous sentence with simplicity and good humour there was nothing like defiance or menace everybody saw that he felt himself on a level with his hearers he spoke as governor-general of the dominion to the people of the united states d'egal a egal he spoke as an englishman to americans mr price collier may say if he chooses that english and americans do not like each other but i will ask him what other two nationalities have the same or anything like the same points of contact and of sympathy there stood lord grey just an englishman holding out his hand to his american cousins 
if the hand happened for that moment to be clenched it was none the less a greeting and was understood as such you could not look into his face without seeing in it the spirit of kinship and of friendship lord grey is preeminently one of those men who think the best relations between men or between communities must spring from frankness he wanted to clear the ground and he did clear it if he had asked anybody's advice he would certainly have been advised not to say what he did he preferred to trust to his own instincts and they proved to be true instincts the danger was that a freedom of speech which would be accepted from his lips might be resented when read in cold print but it was not no american will have forgotten lord grey's gift of his portrait of franklin to philadelphia that endeared him to us still further it was a prize of war which he surrendered taken in the war of the revolution by general sir charles grey it used to hang near the ceiling in one of the reception rooms of Holick house northumberland i saw it there some time before the gift and lord grey told me its history but did not tell me he meant to give it back to america i believe he did ask whether i thought philadelphia would care to have it again a question to which i could not but say yes yet it might also be thought of the family with a good deal more than a hundred years of possession behind it but in this country a hundred years do not count so much as elsewhere the english have long since got into the habit of reckoning by centuries when lord grey went to washington the president asked me to bring him to the white house mrs roosevelt had a reception that evening and i said with her permission i would bring him then very good said the president and mind you bring him to me as soon as you come i did as i was told the president greeted him as he did everybody warmly but in a way that made lord grey understand he was welcome within thirty seconds they were deep in political economy a matter of which lord grey had made a profounder study than the president for the englishman had not like bacon and mr roosevelt taken all knowledge to be his province and was able to master his subject more than once i had occasion to see something of his familiarity with difficult subjects once at dinner when the late mr bight the south african magnate sat on his right and the two discussed financial and political questions mr bight had made a great fortune in south africa and lord grey had not the chartered company had not then proved a mine of wealth to its administrator but the minds of the two were at one the knowledge of each was immense the power of grappling with great subjects was common to both perhaps lord grey sometimes took an imaginative view but the feet of the capitalist were planted in the solid earth the president and the governor-general became friends at once neither of the two being the kind of man to whom friendship requires length of years to come into being it is of course for the interests of both canada and the united states that relations of sympathetic good will should exist between the rulers of each a few hours before their meeting the president knew nothing about lord grey even to mr roosevelt's omniscience there are limits but he desired to know and when he had heard a little of lord grey's history said joyfully all right we have subjects in common and ideas too so the doors of the white house opened wide to the governor-general and lord grey was the president's guest and the impression in canada was a good impression End of chapter thirty chapter thirty one of anglo-american memories by george washburn smalley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty one lord kitchener personal traits and incidents it does not appear that lord kitchener's refusal to accept the mediterranean post to which he was assigned has impaired his popularity or diminished the general confidence in him possibly even official confidence survives in a degree the tone of the prime minister's replies to questions about the refusal may denote resentment but hardly censure so i think i may still venture to reprint sundry personal reminiscences which were written before this collision between the great soldier and the prime minister 
or was it the war minister had occurred the greatest chief of staff living said the germans of lord kitchener possibly with a reservation in favour of themselves they would not go beyond that limited panegyric the remark was made by a german officer high in rank not long after the boer war and it was Peterburg which rankled in his german mind and would not suffer him to award to the english general a great power of generalship in the field but i believe german opinion on that battle has since undergone revision whether it has or not lord kitchener's military renown can easily take care of itself nor is it his soldiership which i am going to discuss i happen to have met him now and then and what else i have to say about him is personal i hope not too personal it was on a journey from london to alderbrook mr raleigh's beautiful place in sussex that i first saw lord kitchener we were a weekend party and went down together in a saloon carriage the figure which next to lord kitchener's stands out clearest is the late lord glesnick's still in the vigour of his versatile powers and accomplishments and attraction the occasion was the more interesting because lord kitchener had then lately returned from egypt and from that victorious campaign which he and he alone had planned and carried through from beginning to end in strict fulfilment of the scheme framed before the actual preparations for it had been begun this also might induce our german military friends to reconsider that chief of staff opinion above quoted it was known that this second hero of khartoum gordon being the first was to travel by this train it was an express and there was no stop before guildford but consider the enthusiasm of the british people when they have a real hero the stations through which the train thundered at forty miles an hour were crowded with people they could not get so much as a glimpse of their idol but they stood and cheered and waved their hats to the train and the invisible hero traveller when we reached guildford six or seven thousand people thronged that station they hurrahed for kitchener and as the cries for kitchener met with no response they were raised again and again lord kitchener sat in a corner buried in a rough grey overcoat silent and bored he had no taste for ovations and triumphal greetings lord glenesk told him he really must show himself and acknowledge these salutations so lord kitchener rose with an ill grace walked to one of the open doors of the saloon raised his hand with a swift military jerk to his bowler and retreated the tumult increased but he would not show himself a second time the cheers rolled on without effect the idol would not be idolized it was not ill temper but indifference he was in mufti and it was the soldier the multitude demanded to see in truth lord kitchener's appearance at the moment was not military it was remarked by his fellow-passengers that he showed to little advantage in his grey clothes none too well fitting when evening came he was another man just as unmistakably the soldier as if in full uniform he was at that time brooding over his gordon college scheme for khartoum he wanted a hundred thousand pounds and he doubted whether he should get it in vain his friends urged him to make his appeal no said lord kitchener nothing less than a hundred thousand pounds will be of any use it is a large sum i should not like to fail and if they gave me only part of the amount i should have to return it he was told that his name would be enough it was the psychological moment delay would only injure his chances lord glenesk offered him a thousand pounds across the dinner-table and other sums were offered there and then and the support of two powerful newspapers was promised still he hesitated and still he repeated i should not like to fail at last one of the company said well lord kitchener if you had doubted about your campaign as you do about this you would never have got to khartoum his face hardened and his reply was characteristic of the man perhaps not but then i could depend on myself and now i have to depend on the british public 
but he did ask for the money and got all and more than all he wanted with no difficulty whatever it appeared that the british public also was to be depended on the united states government was at this time in some perplexity about the philippines where matters were not going well lord kitchener asked what we were going to do about it and how we meant to govern the twelve hundred islands he seemed to think they were giving us more trouble than they ought i explained that the business of annexing territory on the other side of the globe was a new one to us that down to within a few years the american republic was self-contained that we had therefore no machinery for the purpose no civil or military servants intended or trained for distant duties no traditions no experience of any kind and no men whoever went to the philippines had to learn his business from the beginning and the business was a very difficult one lord kitchener listened to all this thought a moment looked across the table and said i should like to govern them for you and although it was not said seriously and could not be it was evident that lord kitchener would very well have liked to take over a job of that kind had it been possible his mind turned readily to executive administrative and creative work the task of reducing eight or nine millions of filipinos and other races to order was one for which he was fitted not long after that an american who had already once been civil governor of the philippines for a short time resumed that post and held it for two years he won the confidence of the people out of chaos he brought order he set up an administrative system he treated the natives justly he brought them to cooperate with their rulers when he left he left behind him a government incomparably better than the islands had ever known life liberty property all civil and personal rights were protected progress had begun trade and commerce had begun to flourish and have continued to flourish so far as tariff conditions permit loyalty a sentiment never before known though a plant of slow growth prevails rebellions are at an end the name of the american who accomplished all this or laid the foundations of it all within two years is taft he is now president of the united states the last time i saw lord kitchener was at a house in one of the southern counties in nineteen o two he was then on his way to take up the commandership in chief of india he drove over to luncheon from another house some sixteen miles away luncheon usually at one o'clock had been put off till one thirty because of the distance he and his friends had to drive a great concession but the roads were heavy and they arrived just before two lord kitchener said to me as we were going in look at me i really cannot sit down to lunch in all this dirt i suggested that he should come to my room he did and after spending ten minutes on his toilette emerged looking not much less the south african campaigner than when he began he said uh, you don't seem to approve oh i was only wondering what you had been doing for ten minutes but late as we are there is one thing you must see and i took him to the hall where stand those two figures in damascened armour inlaid with gold and de montmorency and the constable de bourbon whom a herbert of the sixteenth century had taken prisoners they woke the soldier in this dusty traveller if i were a frenchman i think i would try to get them back it has been tried one of their descendants offered twenty thousand pounds for the pair but you see they are still here we found the rest of the company at table where a place next his hostess was waiting for him if you had seen lord kitchener for the first time you would have felt that his toilette did not much matter the man's personality was the thing there are many men who produce an impression of power but with this man it was military power you could not take him for anything but a soldier not at all the soldier as he presents himself to the youthful imagination he was not in uniform no english soldier ever is except on duty or on occasions of ceremony but it is possible to be a soldier without gold lace or gilt buttons and to appear to be the carriage of his head rising out of square shoulders announced him a soldier so did his pale grey-blue steel-blue eyes 
and the air of command a quite unconscious air for the simplicity of his bearing was as remarkable as anything about him it has been said he is not a natural leader of men not a man whom other men follow in the field just because they cannot help it that he does not inspire his soldiers i doubt it but even were it so he is a man whose orders other men must obey when they are sent his pale steel-blue eyes have in them the hard light of the desert i believe in fact the light of the desert which we consider a poetic thing injured his eyes but there is in them that far-off look as of one whose sight has ranged over great spaces for great intervals of time the races of southeastern europe and of central asia have it there has been seen in london a beautiful girl who has it gazing out from the graceful movement of the waltz on a distant horizon much beyond the walls of a ballroom yet as lord kitchener sits there talking at luncheon the hardness of the face softens the merciless eyes grow kindly and human you may forget if you like the frontal attack at perderberg and the corpse-strewn plains of omdurman and remember only that an english gentleman who has made a study of the science of war sits there devoting himself to the entertainment of two english ladies it is a picture which has a charm of its own and it is a kitchener of whom you hear none too often that is why you hear of him in these social circumstances from me most men have a human side to them even k has and sometimes allows it to be seen he had a human side when he departed without leave from the military academy at woolwich to take a look for himself at what was going on near the french frontier in july or august eighteen seventy when the prussians were giving their french neighbours a lesson in the art of war that seemed to young kitchener a lesson likely to be more profitable than those of woolwich so he went it was a grave breach of discipline i never heard how the matter was settled but it did not keep kitchener out of the army for he entered the royal engineers the next year but i imagine we all like him the better for such an adventure End of chapter thirty one Chapter thirty two of Anglo American Memories by George Washburn Smiley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty two Sir George Lewis, King's Solicitor and Friend, a Social Force. Lord Russell said of him, What is most remarkable in Lewis is not his knowledge of the law, which is very great, nor his skill in the conduct of difficult causes, in which he is unrivalled nor his tact nor his genius for compromise it is his courage that was said not long after the parnell trial in which lord russell then sir charles russell and afterwards lord chief justice of england who had long been at the head of the english bar of his own time proved himself the equal of any advocate of any time yet he must divide the honours of that trial with sir george lewis the profession or the two professions of barrister and solicitor divided them if the public did not the public has almost never the means of judging the work of preparing a great cause is carried on in the solicitor's office the barrister takes it up ready-made and the way in which he handles his material is seen of all men but no barrister badly briefed could make much of a complicated case in no trial was this truer than in the parnell trial parnell was perhaps the greatest political leader of his time and the least scrupulous he had a black record and the men behind him a blacker not even sir george lewis could wash it all white but without him the judgment would have gone far more heavily against the irish dictator and if ever there was a case in which lord russell's eulogy on sir george lewis was to the point it was the parnell case it needed all his courage in handling facts to save his client from a condemnation which would have carried with it his banishment from public life mr gladstone marked his sense of the service done by making mr george lewis sir george lewis the knighthood some years later became a baronetcy the late king i believe suggesting it 
for the late king while prince of wales had stood to the great solicitor in the relation of client and this business connection had become one of friendship they were much together at homburg where both spent three or four weeks each year for many years homburg is a place where the houses are of glass and everything is known the prince gave his dinners at ritter's or at the cursal in the open air if he went afterward to play whist for these were anti-bridge days at mr lewis's rooms that was known nor is publicity so far as prince and king are concerned much less in england and when mr lewis dined at marlborough house or was present at a levee at st james palace or was a guest at sandringham all these things were of common knowledge and since the english are a very loyal people who had a strong personal attachment to their late king the confidence and liking the king showed him won for sir george the confidence and liking of others this great and eventful career has lasted more than fifty years and with the end of nineteen o nine sir george lewis being seventy-six years old retired from business leaving his son mr george lewis and his other partner mr reginald poole both for many years his associates to be his successors both are widely known as learned and skilful in the law both have been trained in sir george's methods and the new firm is still like the old known as lewis and lewis and they are still of ely place holborn it is characteristic of old days and ways in london that sir george lewis was born in one of the three houses now occupied by the firm his father was a solicitor before him a man of repute and ability yet none the less is this vast business the creation of the sun there are in london many firms of solicitors known the world over the messrs freshfield for example solicitors to the bank of england but there is seldom or never a fame due to one man it is due to combined action to organization to concentration upon one kind of business the firm of lewis and lewis knew no limitations the public thought of sir george lewis as the man to whom the conduct of great causes was habitually entrusted sometimes criminal sometimes social even divorce cases often those causes in which the honour of a great name or a great family is involved true but the business of messrs lewis and lewis was first of all a great commercial business sir george's permanent clients were among the city firms famous in finance or in banking or in industry that was the backbone of the business and continues to be the first case in which mr lewis made himself known to the public arose out of the failure of overend gurney and company then one of the leading houses in the city of london he fought that case single-handed against barristers of renown a bold thing for a solicitor to do and perhaps without precedent he did the same thing in the bravo murder case and held his own and more than his own against attorney-general and solicitor-general no doubt had he chosen he might have gone to the bar and become distinguished at the bar but not so had he chosen to model his life he never could have played the part he has had he done that for the dividing line between solicitor and barrister in england is just as clearly drawn as ever you may be one or the other you cannot be both you may pass from one to the other but you must elect between the two i ask myself sometimes what london society would be today had there been no george lewis it certainly would not be what it is there have been many many calls celebres in which his name has figured in open court or in the still more open newspapers but they are as one to a hundred of those which have never been tried and never supplied material for legal proceedings or for printed scandal the simple truth is that sir george lewis though the most successful of solicitors in contested causes has made fame and fortune by keeping cases out of court and out of print he carried the art of compromise to its highest point he saw that alike in the interests of his client and of the public and in his own interests also the greatest service he could do was to prevent litigation in that he has acted consistently for fifty years of how many lawyers can anything like that be said 
Sir George Lewis stands alone. The money results of his policy are splendid. His renown is splendid. But the misery he has soothed, and the social disruptions and disturbances and far-reaching disasters he has prevented, are a tribute more splendid still. And perhaps never has the value of his advice been so evident as when it has been rejected. In the matter which shook London society perhaps more than any other of recent years, Sir George Lewis on one side, and a brilliant young solicitor, Mr. Charles Russell, son of the late Lord Chief Justice, on the other, had come to an agreement. The instrument they had drawn jointly was ready for signature. So quietly had all this distressing business been transacted, that had the instrument been signed then and there, the world would never have heard there had been a disagreement till it learned there had been a settlement. But outside influences intervened. One of the two signatures was withheld. Then scandal broke loose, and the sewers of London overflowed all winter. There were reproaches, recriminations, divisions, all London taking one side or the other. Then, in the spring, the same instrument, word for word, was signed. The solicitors had never wavered, nor perhaps ever doubted that since they were agreed, their clients must ultimately agree. It is a typical example of Sir George Lewis's methods, but the mischief that had been done by intruders could not be undone. Sleeping for half a century, or for only years and months, in the black japanned tin boxes which lined the walls in Ely Place and in his safes were papers enough to compromise half London and scandalize the other half. Sir George, reflecting some years ago on this state of things, looked through the collection and then burnt the whole. That is the best possible answer to the foolish story that he intended writing his memoirs. His sense of professional etiquette and his sense of honour may both be judged in the light of these flaming documents. It had been necessary, of course, to preserve some of these papers for a time on the chance of their being needed again. But think of the relief with which hundreds and hundreds of people heard of the burning. It is almost as if the tragedies of which all record was thus destroyed had never happened. Footnote i have since asked sir george himself about this conflagration story he answered yes it is true but there are things here touching his forehead which i can neither burn nor forget End note. sir george lewis could coerce as well as coax he could use threats but never a threat he was not ready to fulfil by and by his character came to be so well understood that a letter from Ely Place became almost a summons to surrender, but always on reasonable terms. With all that, he had a kindness of heart to which thousands of people can testify. I suppose no lawyer ever did so much for clients without fee or reward. If you were his friend, if you were of a profession, if you came to him with a letter from some friend, if you came to him in poverty with a case of oppression, he would take infinite pains for you, and no fee. He had all sorts of out-of-the-way knowledge, copyright law for one, on which he was an authority, and in which few solicitors are authorities. There is this link between copyright in books and in plays and theatrical contracts. The contract is commonly drawn by the publisher or manager, who is a man of business, and the author or actor, who is not, is expected to accept it. It was this solicitor's pleasure to redress that balance. He was a law reformer. Again, unlike most successful men, who are apt to be content with things as they are. The letters he wrote to the Times on such matters as the creation of a court of criminal appeal, alteration in the law of divorce, the administration of justice, and other high legal questions show him a great scientific lawyer with a mastery of principles. He was essentially a legal mind, and he wrote with a luminous precision and force not always characteristic of the legal mind and he had what every judge on the bench ought to have, and a few of the greatest really have, an unerring perception of such facts as are essential, and a power of dismissing all the rest. Sir George Jessel had that, 
one of the greatest judges. Students of ethnology may remark with interest that both were Jews. When such a man quits the stage, it is an irreparable loss to his friends, to his clients, and to the world generally. The feeling is more than regret, for ties are broken which never existed before and will never exist again. Sir George Lewis's position was unique because his personality is unique. So will his fame be. Reputation in the law is for the most part transitory, but this will endure. End of chapter 32chapter thirty three of anglo-american memories by george washburn smalley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty three mr mills a personal appreciation and a few anecdotes i recrossed the atlantic for a moment there died lately in california a man known on both sides of the ocean known in more worlds than two one of the strongest and certainly one of the most amiable figures in the world of business mr darius ogden mills of late years since mr reed has been ambassador mr mills had become a figure in london he interested englishmen because he was a new type or rather because he was individual because he was mr mills type implies a plurality and not only was there but one mills there was none other to whom you could compare him englishmen have formed a notion of their own about americans of the class to which in respect of his wealth mr mills belonged and a high notion they have seen much for example of mr pierpont morgan and they seemed inclined to suppose all great financiers to be in manner as in fact masterful dominating huge in physique born rulers of other men they had never seen much if anything of mr harriman who hid away his great qualities beneath a personality almost insignificant in appearance save for the ample head and burning eyes mr mills was perceived to be like neither of these nor like any third he was much more like an oxford professor like the late rev mark pattison rector of lincoln the casabon of george eliot's novel mr mills had the gentleness the refinement the distinction of the scholar it must have been born with him he went to no college he had little college learning he had lived in rough times and among rough men had twice crossed the continent on foot and in the saddle with a cloud of red indians ever on the horizon and had lived in san francisco during those stormy years when bret hart's heroes gamblers and ruffians set up their turbulent rule but there was a light in mr mill's pale blue eyes which kept those gentlemen at a distance this delicately featured face ended in a jaw which was an index of a character not to be trifled with. Upon all this, London remarked with some surprise, and then with great respect and liking. They liked his simplicity of manner as much as his sagacity of speech, and his silence almost as much as his conversation. An American who was an American to the fingertips, but never waved the flag. A man of affairs who seemed in the world only a man of the world, a millionaire in whose pockets the jingle of the dollar was never heard. Such was the rare picture Mr. Mills presented. He won their sympathies because he never tried to. These islanders like a man who is just himself, yet is absolutely free from self-assertion. They gave him first their respect, then their regard, and finally their affection. I have seen all these feelings shown in the Metropolitan Club in New York in an unusual way. Mr. Mills used to come into the card room of an afternoon. There would be two or three or more rubbers of bridge going on. Bridge is a passion, but men would stop in the middle of a rubber and ask Mr. Mills if he would not take a hand or make up a new rubber. Bridge being not only a passion, but the selfish game it is, necessarily so, like business, the tribute was a remarkable one. If he declined, somebody would remember suddenly he had an engagement and beg Mr. Mills as a favor to take his place. As he moved about in the club, men rose and walked across the room to greet him, a thing less rare in New York, but unknown in London, 
where a club has been defined as a place in which a man may cut his best friend and no offense taken the general ceremoniousness of club life in new york would close all the clubhouses in london so would the despotism of new york club committees men listened to him or waited for him to speak in a way which suggested not only a desire for an opinion but an attachment to the man he himself was one of the best listeners ever known when he spoke it was briefly he could say what he wanted to in a sentence or a few sentences in this he was like another and a greater oxford don i suppose the greatest of his time jowett the master of balliol both sat long silent while others were talking and both seemed to use and jowett certainly did use the interval in fashioning his thoughts into epigrams jowett's epigrams often stung and were meant to sting for he thought presumption and ignorance ought to be punished perhaps mr mills did but he did not think he had been appointed to punish them a group of men in the club were one day discussing great fortunes and the men who owned them everybody thought and spoke in millions and tens of millions finally someone appealed to the only silent man in the company what do you say mr mills i say that in all these cases or almost all i think it's safe to divide the figures by two in your own case also above all in my case we travelled up together once by the night express to the adirondacks on a visit to mr reed's camp arriving at the station at six in the morning then driving to the lake then in a boat to the camp which could not be reached otherwise after his long night journey he was fresh and alert and not the least tired and he talked freely he even discussed business and presently remarked i have been a little anxious about money matters and was not sure i could get away from new york but why oh but my bank balances are much larger than i like them to be i made the obvious and rather foolish answer that there were plenty of people who would be willing to relieve him from this anxiety to which he retorted you know nothing about it i am not speaking of myself but a man in my position has his duties as trustee for others to consider whether i get three per cent or four per cent for my money may not much matter though i prefer five but to many of those for whom i act it does matter and to them i am under an obligation i must fulfil no man who is not or has not been in business can have any notion of the ramifications and complications of business but it's worth your while to consider that it was the longest speech i had ever heard him make and the didactic touch at the end was equally new it was not his way to lecture people he held strong considered opinions on many subjects but thought it no part of his duty to impress them on the world though his sure judgment was at the service of his friends his fame and wealth and position had come to him from what he had done not by sermonizing or rhetoric men trusted him there was perhaps no man more generally trusted it is nothing to say he never betrayed a trust he discharged it to the utmost measure of his ability the money which others had put into his hands had to earn as much as money could earn three per cent on deposits would seem to an englishman affluence but mr mills appeared to think he was unfair to his clients to be content even temporarily with three when it could be invested to earn more at the camp he talked more freely than elsewhere the air was tonic the life suited him in the adirondacks you do get back into closer relations with nature and on more intimate terms with the great natural forces about you this is true in spite of the luxurious simplicity of the camps but mr mills was always happy where his daughter was i may not dwell on such a matter but her devotion to him was the light of his life he came to london to be with her she returned to america to be with him if his duties and responsibilities had permitted his visits here would have been longer and more frequent once while i was sitting with him in his office in broad street his lawyer came in with a contract for him to sign mr mills hardly glanced at it took up his pen to sign stopped and said to the lawyer i suppose it is all right 
oh yes mr mills i think you will find your interest protected in every way that is not what i mean i want to know whether you have drawn this agreement so as to leave mr a a profit large enough to ensure his doing his best he must have his fair share a business view perhaps and for aught i know common in the business world but i had never happened to hear it put quite like that nor have i since with that may be compared another saying a little company all men of business but me were discussing business methods one or two of them stated rather crudely what are sometimes called the methods of wall street there is no sentiment in business said one a man who thinks of others interests will soon have none of his own to consider remarked a second and a third whose career was strewn with wrecks declared of course you have to crush those who stand in your way said mr mills i have done pretty well in business but i never crushed anybody the mills hotels were an expression of his sentiment toward the society amid which he lived to the environment which had given him his later opportunities he wanted to enlarge the opportunities of other men to sweeten their lives a little to enable them to do more for themselves his scheme was derided and was a success from the start and the success has grown greater ever since the success was due to the patience with which he thought out his plans the afternoon before i sailed from new york in nineteen o six i met mr mills and his victoria at the door of the metropolitan club come for a drive in the park he said and we went he began at once to talk about his new hotel we drove for two hours and during nearly all that time he discussed plans estimates details methods of economical working organization the effect on the tenants and a hundred other matters relating to the building equipment and operation of the hotel soon to be erected he had all the facts and figures in his mind he talked with an enthusiasm he rarely showed his heart was in it to the last his energy seemed inexhaustible and his interests he arrived one afternoon at dorchester house at five o'clock from new york there was a large dinner at eight thirty then a ball which he did not leave till toward one in the morning i met him again at tea next day and he told me he had been at the white city since nine that morning and when i suggested that he had gone about that marvellous but very fatiguing show in a chair he said oh no on my legs nor did he seem tired nor mind the prospect of another large dinner that night he was then eighty-two years old pneumonia had attacked him winter after winter but he always rallied and would take no better care of himself than before in that slight erect figure nature had packed powers of endurance which bigger frames had not everything was reduced to its essence there was nothing superfluous and nothing wanting the features were sculptured it was the face of a man who had a real distinction of nature who had benignity and judgment and acute perceptions all in equal measure they bore the stamp of an impregnable integrity as his life did unlike qualities in him melted into harmony and a rounded whole for with his unyielding firmness and strength and uncompromising convictions and invincible sense of justice went a loving kindness which made him the most lovable of men that was mr mills End of chapter thirty three Chapter thirty four of Anglo American Memories by George Washburn Smalley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty four Lord Randolph Churchill being mostly personal impressions. One I venture on an anecdote or two which I have told elsewhere, but imperfectly, those whom it concerns being now dead or retired. They were three, Mr. Chamberlain, Lord Randolph Churchill, and Mr. Archibald Forbes, all at that moment in the splendor, the blinding splendor, of their gifts and powers. It was after luncheon. The ladies had gone, Lord Randolph had been Secretary of State for India, and Forbes, like Lord Randolph, had lately been in India, and the talk turned upon India. 
all three were men who spoke their minds not at all an uncommon practice in this country where men dissent freely and even bluntly from the expressed opinion of others and no offence taken lord randolph and forbes differed sharply neither stood in awe of the other or of any man forbes would make a statement lord randolph would answer i know you have been in india but from what you say i shouldn't suppose you knew where it was lord randolph would go on to point out what he thought forbes mistakes then forbes yes you have ruled india but the real india is a sealed book to you and so on presently they discussed the indian civil service and mr chamberlain came to the front in the new civil service lay he thought the hope of india appointments were no longer jobbed a new class of men were brought into the service by examination well taught well trained competent and drawn from the whole people of england lord randolph listened impatiently interrupted now and then but on the whole listened when mr chamberlain had finished lord randolph burst out i have heard that before no greater nonsense was ever talked what is the indian civil service or rather what was it a boy of twenty went out as a clerk from calcutta he was sent up country nominally in charge of a bureau really to govern a district he did govern it he had passed no examination very likely he couldn't tell you the date of the battle of Plassey or the lineage of a native prince he had no mathematics no latin and probably couldn't spell but he had character he knew how to govern because he came of a governing class and he was a gentleman whereas now looking steadily at chamberlain instead of a gentleman you get men from uh, birmingham and god knows where chamberlain who seldom declined any contest to which he was invited sat cool and smiling while lord randolph launched his shafts when he had emptied his quiver the member for birmingham still cool and smiling observed that he thought it was time for us to join the ladies and we did instantly the sky cleared india was forgotten the two combatants walked upstairs arm in arm and the storm was as if it had never been the little scene in which lord randolph churchill was the chief actor brings that vivid personality once again vividly to mind indeed it is never long absent from the general memory he has left a mark on the public life of this country which will last as long as anything lasts and he has left a portrait of himself in the memory of all who really knew him besides which he has left a son who does not allow us long to forget his existence or his relation to the affairs of the moment a great authority was quoted quite lately as saying winston is an abler man even than his father i asked him whether he said it no i said cleverer not abler which seemed a very just distinction i have not really much to add to the account of lord randolph which i wrote in january eighteen ninety five upon his death i adhere to all i then said the estimate seems to me fair if not complete the years that have passed take nothing from lord randolph's fame if anything they add to it and for this reason his conception of the political future of his country was a true conception to him the year eighteen eighty four with its revolutionary enlargement of the suffrage was the turning point of modern english history the middle classes vacated the throne they had occupied since eighteen thirty two the working classes succeeded to their inheritance their power has greatly grown they are two-thirds of the electorate to-day they have it is true but thirty out of the six hundred and seventy members of parliament but these figures are in no respect representative of their real authority they and the irish nationalists hold the balance of power in the house of commons they returned fewer members to the house this year than in nineteen o six but that was because of an arrangement between them and the liberals for value received and no man doubts that the power of the labor party will hereafter increase and not decrease 
for the first time in the history of england they openly proclaimed their purpose to legislate and to influence legislation in the interest of a single class and not in the interest of all classes and of the country as a whole their excuse is that they are a majority but the day when a majority takes no account of the minority or thinks a minority has no rights which the majority is bound to respect is a black day in the history of any country but this in substance if not in detail is what lord randolph foresaw and announced and he was the only man to foresee it he did not disdain as mr gladstone did to look ahead to form to himself some conception of what the future of england was to be with this rising tide of democracy his conception as i said was a true conception and the political genius of the man was never more clearly visible than in this forecast and in the means he proposed to himself and to his party for dealing with a situation absolutely new lord randolph's dartford speech in eighteen eighty six will therefore remain a monument to his sagacity it was a speech which may be read to-day with profit and admiration so may that at birmingham of which trust the people is the motto i will go farther if i wanted a body of political doctrine to put into the hands of an american student of english politics i would as soon offer him lord randolph's speeches as any other there is no complete collection but there are the two volumes edited by mr lewis jennings and published by messrs longmans in eighteen eighty nine they cover a period of only nine years eighteen eighty to eighty eight but they are a handbook to the political life of england for a generation lord randolph had this rare merit rare in this country he dealt habitually with principles and his treatment of political questions was not empirical but scientific and he was absolutely fearless he was fearless alike in public and in private and he looked his own fortunes in the face whether they presented themselves to him with the promise of good or of ill he knew he was a doomed man he cast his own horoscope shortly before he flung that fatal card upon the table which cost him the game in his long contest with lord salisbury he said i shall be five years in office or in opposition then i shall be five years prime minister then i shall die and he was right as to the length of his life though a perverse fate and his one fatal miscalculation i forgot goshen falsified the rest of his prediction mr winston churchill queries this saying but i am inclined to think it authentic many of these matters i used to hear lord randolph discuss in private and even now i suppose they must remain private though the impression his talks left may fairly be described i listened to his views on finance long before he was finance minister through nearly the whole of a long summer afternoon we were at cliveden that beautiful possession had not then passed into mr astor's hands it still belonged to the duke of westminster and had been lent by him to the duchess of marlborough widow of that seventh duke of marlborough who was viceroy of ireland and lord randolph's mother the duchess was a woman who may always be adduced in support of the theory that qualities of mind and character descend from mother to son she was a woman of great natural shrewdness and force with an insight into the true nature of such things as interested her and the one thing that interested her above all others was her second son lord randolph come for a drive after lunch said lord randolph and we went in a dog-cart to burnham beaches and taplaw and elsewhere for many miles and hours through the woods which are one of the glories of that delightful country it was a perfect afternoon you were not the least disposed to ask with lowell what is so rare as a day in june rather in the afternoon they came unto a land in which it seemed always afternoon and always june that is one of the enchantments of this versatile climate when in a good mood you think it will be always good and the enchantments in and around cliveden were many and to-day are many more to all of them lord randolph seemed for the moment insensible 
his mind was upon finance and upon finance he discoursed during the better part of three hours to the sunlight and the flower-strewn hedges and the far-reaching forests he paid no more attention than he did to his driving the horse took his own pace and being a well-trained animal showed a sensible preference for his own side of the road lord randolph's talk was not much more than thinking aloud his financial opinions which became afterward like those of all chancellors of the exchequer rigid were in process of formation now and then he asked a question about the treasury in america but for the most part his monologue was a soliloquy i know few things more instructive than to see a mind like his at work he thought as he talked on but the sentences fell from his lips clean-cut and finished he was not announcing conclusions nor laying down laws finance was then comparatively new to him he would take up any idea or view as it occurred to him hold it before him look at it from all sides and either drop it or put it on a shelf till he could see how it fitted with the next i said as he pressed a proposal i've forgotten what you break with all tradition what do you suppose i'm here for have you ever known me to adopt an opinion because somebody else had adopted it and in truth i had not nor had any one part of his charm lay in his independence and a large part he was fettered by no restrictions nor overborne by any authority once only as he told me at another time did he find himself in the presence of a superior being mr gladstone to wit i could argue but before the man himself i bent but i have related that story in the paper referred to above yet we find lord randolph telling prince bismarck who asked him whether the english people would exchange mr gladstone for general caprivi the english people would cheerfully give you mr gladstone for nothing but you would find him an expensive present of prince bismarck however lord randolph seems not to have received the same impression he did of mr gladstone high as is the tribute he pays them there had been a little friction in eighteen eighty eight in berlin prince bismarck had refused to see lord randolph or to meet him at lunch at count herbert's and he calls the great chancellor a gringer old creature who kept away because lord randolph had used all his influence to prevent lord salisbury from being towed in his wake but at kissenden in eighteen ninety three lord randolph alas being no longer in a position to influence nor prince bismarck alas any longer chancellor of the empire he had created there was a meeting lord randolph wrote an account of it to his mother and the letter a most picturesque letter is given in the life lord randolph felt the fascination the prince could exercise when he chose and pays due tribute to him but it is admiration not awe he feels in the great german's presence in truth lord randolph had said savage things of prince bismarck in days past as well as of mr gladstone if you want to sup with him you must have a long spoon the domestic and personal side of lord randolph had a fascination quite other than that of his political life simplicity was one note of it that and the absolute freedom from affectation which is natural to a man whose courage is equal to every demand i began meaning to be domestic and personal but i shrink from saying most of the things i should like to two summers in succession he had an old elizabethan house near edgham known as great forsters the house still encompassed by a moat mostly dry i had always thought him at his best in his own home where whoever might be his guest he recognized his obligations as host and his manner softened and the lawlessness of his tongue was restrained this impression grew stronger with these visits it happened that two of their guests his and lady randolph's were attractive to both of them as well as to the rest of the world the two were the beautiful duchess of leinster and sir henry dumman wolfe the duchess of leinster was at that time in the full splendour of her loveliness i had never seen her except at a ball or dinner or on some other social occasion in the glory of a toilette and of her shoulders and diamonds when she was perhaps 
the most resplendent object to be seen in london at great forster's she went about during the day in the simplest of gowns she was less dazzling but not less charming as for sir henry drummond wolfe he and lord randolph set each other off their intimacy was both political and personal if i may use such a word of two men i should say they were on affectionate terms both of them were capable of cynicism but that only made their affection the more striking there were no ties of blood but as you looked on this little group and listened to their talk which was both easy and brilliant you felt as if you were present at a family gathering two lord randolph churchill despised two things which i am told are much respected in the united states public opinion and money of course in public life he had to take account of public opinion and he was a very good judge of it and in eighteen eighty six he taught his party to take account of it but what i mean is that while he admitted and asserted the necessity of calculating forces as the first business of a statesman he was never subservient to that majority which he sought to make his own he was not frightened by names and he did not shrink from unpopularity he told prince bismarck at kissingen that nobody in england cared a rap what the papers said which meant that he lord randolph did not care a rap yet at opportune moments he used the press with skill or if i ought not to say used he availed himself adroitly of the press to serve his own purpose his midnight journey to the times office in printing house square in order to tell mr buckle that he had resigned from lord salisbury's ministry and that his resignation had been accepted is a case in point it is just conceivable that mr buckle took or might have taken a more lenient view of lord randolph's coup de tete from having the exclusive news of it it is at any rate conceivable that the resigning minister imagined or hoped a friendly opinion would be expressed i will give a very different instance which came to my knowledge directly at the time of the great dock strike which disordered and threatened to destroy all the waterside industries of the port of london cardinal manning sided with the strikers he was a prelate who often mixed politics with his religion or to put it more charitably with his ecclesiastical polity he went to the east end and made a speech at the strikers meeting undeterred by the fact that they were threatening violence and he wound up by giving twenty-five pounds to the cause of these enemies of public order all this came out in next morning's papers toward noon i went to see lord randolph he was full of the subject and his sympathies with the men were evident he had read cardinal manning's speech and with certain reservations approved of it do you think he ought to have given money to encourage disorder what do you mean by encouraging disorder the men are out of work they and their wives are starving i would gladly give twenty-five pounds myself if i had it nevertheless i suppose no act of cardinal manning nothing he did in his extremely variegated career brought upon him more or better deserved censure in the press than the countenance he gave to this very dangerous industrial rebellion the censure upon lord randolph would surely have been not less severe but what cared he lord randolph i ought to add had been during a great part of his too short political life the friend and champion of the working men he believed them to be the necessary support of the conservative party without which as the event proved that party could win no great victory at the polls he believed them to be as a body like the majority of the english people irrespective of party essentially conservative he was ready to do what he could to lighten and brighten their sometimes dreary lot it was not only as a politician that he interested himself in their fortunes he had a man's sympathy with other men less fortunate than himself less fortunate but perhaps not always much less for what i said above about lord randolph's indifference to money was true during nearly all his life and was shown in many ways to his own hurt he had the usual younger son's portion and in this country of magnificent estates the younger son's portion is of the most modest description 
not otherwise than by reserving the great bulk of the family wealth to eldest sons one after the other can these magnificent estates be kept together and kept magnificent but lord randolph's tastes and ambitions were nowise in proportion to the slenderness of his income the present mr winston churchill in his most admirable life of his father has made some reference to two occasions in which questions of money became critical he has said so much that i think i may say a little more the first was in anticipation of his marriage mr jerome had the ideas of the average american father about settlements lord randolph's ideas on that subject were english there was a collision between the two the wooer had already announced to his father the seventh duke of marlborough his attachment to miss jerome and the duke had agreed provisionally to the engagement mr jerome had agreed but his views about money threatened to break off the negotiations at the end they had lasted seven months lord randolph refused utterly to agree to any settlement which contained even technical provisions to which he objected he delivered to mr jerome what his biographer rightly calls an ultimatum he was ready to earn a living in england or out of it without mr jerome's help and in this the girl agreed with him mr jerome capitulated perhaps the difference between them was more a matter of form than anything the terms of the final agreement are not stated in the life they have often been stated in london where everything on every subject of human interest is known and where it was always understood that mr jerome agreed to settle two thousand pounds a year on his daughter and son-in-law with remainder to the children duly secured by a mortgage on the university club house in madison square but what i ask you to notice is the readiness of lord randolph to fling away an income far larger than he had ever had unless it came to him on such terms as he thought right and unless his english views were accepted by this american father the other instance relates to south africa when he went to mashonaland in eighteen ninety one he borrowed five thousand pounds from a good and staunch friend whom i should like to name well why should i not i mean lord rothschild whose kindnesses to men of every degree and of all religions and races have been innumerable if ever a great fortune paid in the long ago phrase of mr chamberlain a ransom his has paid it not compulsory but from true good will to men lord randolph invested the five thousand pounds in rand gold mining shares on the advice of that american engineer of genius mr perkins who inferred from the dip of the gold-bearing reefs the direction and depth at which they could be overtaken by shafts sunk far south of the actual gold area the world knows the result and is the richer by hundreds of millions for the vision which pierced the outer crest of the earth and saw the treasures hidden below mr perkins was in fact the engineer whom lord rothschild had sent to south africa with lord randolph they had gone through mashonaland together vainly and the ex-chancellor of the exchequer now invested his five thousand pounds in rand shares but values of that nature require time and being in want of money he sold two-fifths of his investment the remainder he held till his death when it was disposed of for something over seventy thousand pounds a comfortable fortune to leave yes comfortable enough to pay the debts of the estate that was one form which his contempt for money took he lived on the principal it is no matter of censure he was born and built that way the strain of frugality in the first duke of marlborough had worn itself out my last meeting with lord randolph was at tring lord rothschild's place in buckinghamshire he was already in the grip of the illness which was to destroy him nervous irritable restless in manner haggard to look at and his speech uncertain i don't like to think of it and i mention it only for the sake of the contrast for now and again the old brilliancy reappeared and the old charm he had both in a measure given to few men 
wilful as he was with a freedom of speech which overpassed the usual social limits he had also when he chose the graces and gifts which made him beloved of men and of women no man made more enemies but in this world by which i mean this world of england and other worlds where the english people have built new civilizations it is not enmities which count but friendships whether you saw him in the house of commons leading it as no man had ever led it or at a dinner or on the platform or if you like on the turf or in other places which the puritans think of the devil he had the same ascendancy he said once to lord rosebery that to both of them their titles had been helpful in public life no doubt but something besides a title descends or may descend to him who bears it not every son of a duke has upon him the stamp of the patrician that is what lord randolph had an imperious temper an intellectual disdain of natures from which intellects had been omitted moods of black despair late in life but all through life the set resolved to win his battles without much thought of the cost all these he had and no one of them nor all of them broke or impaired the spell he laid upon those about him narrow means never stented his generosity uncertain health never stilled his passion for work i never went into his library that i did not find him busy i have seen him at dinner turn away from the distinguished woman who passed for the most amusing of talkers to devote himself to a neglected stranger when he quarrelled with the prince of wales king edward and went into a kind of social exile for seven years while he was quite aware of the price he was paying he never dreamed of surrender when lord salisbury not choosing to remember or perhaps not able to remember his services and his capacities passed him over in eighteen ninety one for the last time and gave the leadership of the house of commons to his nephew mr balfour he writes to his wife all confirms me in my decision to have done with politics and try to make a little money for the boys and for ourselves on his release from party obligations he sought others and his sister lady tweedmouth between whom and himself there was on both sides a devoted attachment persuaded him to see something of men from whom he had held aloof mr gladstone was among these and i end with mr gladstone's remark about lord randolph he was the courtliest man i ever met end of chapter thirty four chapter thirty five of anglo-american memories by george washburn smalley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty five lord glenesk and the morning post the owning or leasing of several houses is an english habit which is no longer confined to great landowners who have inherited their possessions many men whose success in life is their own adopt the custom among many instances i will take one for other reasons than house-owning the late lord glenesk who had at one time a lease of invercald the fine place belonging to the farquharson family there as later at glenwish he liked to gather friends about him and there was each year a succession of parties in the beginning mr borthwick he became successively sir algernon borthwick and lord glenesk his name and his wife's connect themselves with many social memories in scotland in london where the house in piccadilly was long a brilliant centre and in cannes where they occupied in winter the chateau saint michel at the californie end of the town in beautiful grounds touching on the sea they had also for some years that square red brick house in hampstead on the edge of the heath with a little land and a brick wall about it and there they entertained of a sunday during part of the season both had the art of hospitality and the secret of social life by which i mean the secret of translating mere hospitality into happiness for others mr borthwick acquired the morning post in eighteen seventy six it was then a threepenny paper six cents on each of six days of the week no englishman had ever then thought of a sunday edition of a daily paper 
nor has since there are sunday papers in london of which one the observer is a supremely able journal but they are published one and all on sundays only when the morning post passed into the hands of its late proprietor the penny paper had already made its appearance though not the halfpenny the future it was thought belonged to the penny but the morning post like the times was supposed to appeal to a special class it was the organ of the fashionable world you went to it for all that fashionable intelligence now supplied more or less completely by all papers it was the one newspaper which lay on the table of every drawing-room in mayfair and belgravia and in every country house throughout the kingdom till borthwick became editor it was respectable decorous conventional and dull it had little news except what came to it through reuter and other news agencies there were flashes of vivacity when young borthwick went to paris a city he understood and sent home sparkling letters which were the most readable things in the paper and always seemed a little out of place it was an organ of conservatism but the kind of conservatism expounded in its editorial columns was more orthodox than inspiring it had a moderate circulation and its net yearly profits were not far from thirty thousand dollars when mr borthwick came into control of this property not at first but not very long after he conceived the notion of turning it into a penny paper it was he who told me the story he had originality and he had courage but he was also a man who sought advice in great enterprises and he talked this scheme over with many men of experience far greater than his own he said to me later one and all they advised me against it one and all they thought it spelled ruin or if not ruin a great risk to a valuable though not great property and the certainty of loss they told me i should inevitably forfeit the support of the classes to whom the post had always appealed and that i should not gain new subscribers from other classes in numbers sufficient to make good these losses i should lose not only readers but advertisers for the advertisers in the post were largely the west end tradespeople who desired to reach their west end patrons i should lose the political authority which was based on the support of the privileged classes in short a penny morning post was inconceivable and unthinkable from any point of view whatever to all of which borthwick listened he considered every argument and objection and protest laid before him but he was one of those men who regarded the opinions of other men not as authoritative but as the material for forming his own opinions and he summed the whole story up in a sentence every journalist and every man of business whom i consulted was opposed to the change and i finally took my decision to make the morning post a penny paper in the face of a unanimous remonstrance by friends and experts of all kinds when borthick told me this some years had passed since the change had been made he said in the first year the profit of the paper doubled in the second they reached twenty thousand pounds by the fifth the amount was thirty thousand pounds and so it went on until the annual net income of the morning post was sixty thousand pounds ten times what it had been at the price of threepence it continued to be the organ of the classes not however refusing to accept that tory democracy of which lord randolph churchill was the inventor upon which toryism conservatism and unionism have ever since thriven neither mayfair nor belgravia nor the country houses ever tried to do without it the advertisers continued to advertise it became moreover the organ of the better class of servants butlers ladies maids footmen and the multitude of menials who sought places in the best houses in other respects also the paper was revolutionized it became a newspaper the day of the humdrum was over it had special news services and capable men to conduct them borthwick was a patient man impatient of dullness he gathered about him good journalists and good writers not always the same thing you now began to read the news and letters and leaders from some other motive than a sense of duty they were readable the hand of the master left its mark on every column 
nor did the demands of journalism exhaust sir algernon bothick's energies he went into politics and into parliament sitting for a vast constituency in south kensington lady bothick's help in this political and election business was invaluable that very accomplished lady brought to bear upon the voters of south kensington a kind of influence to which they had been unaccustomed a social influence their wives took part in the game neither having nor desiring votes but able to affect the course of events as much as if the ballot had been theirs and more lady borthwick had twenty five hundred names on her visiting list and they were more than names each name stood for an individual whom lady borthwick knew and whose value she knew the beautiful white drawing-room at number one thirty nine piccadilly was in those days a little more thronged of an afternoon or evening than it had been but was never crowded some of the best music in london was to be heard there at tea-time the dinners were carefully studied dances and evening parties had a slightly political flavour but were none the less successful there is i suppose no place where more than in london their gentle influences have a more soothing effect upon an electorate if any reader reflects on the true nature of the exploit which borthwick accomplished he will perhaps agree that the man capable of it must have had a high order of genius if it was not creative in the sense that lord northcliffe's is creative it was perfectly adapted to the circumstances and the time it has not perhaps been quite adequately recognized lord glenesk was so much a figure in society that when his name was mentioned men who knew only the surface of things saw in him the ornament of a ballroom he was that and he was so very much more that this ballroom part of his life is hardly even incidental he would dance night after night in the daytime his mind applied itself to some of the stiffest problems of a very difficult profession he told me one morning he had not been in bed for three nights the only answer i could make was that i did not know he ever went to bed but i knew that after sleepless nights he spent days of necessary hard work at the office and that he brought to each matter he dealt with the freshness of a fresh mind it was late in life before he began to know the meaning of the word tired take him for all in all i should name lord glenesk as one of the three great men i have known in english journalism and whether in or out of journalism he had a kindliness a charm a sweet authority in the affairs of life which do not belong to all successful men by and by there appeared in lady borthwick's drawing-room a fresh flower of a girl whose presence at her mother's afternoon concerts and then at evening parties was a little in advance of her coming out miss lilias borthwick is now the countess bathurst and i believe has when she chooses to exercise it full control over the morning post of which mr fabian ware is the present editor a young journalist who has made himself a name in his profession lady bathurst is like her mother one of those women who possess better means of making their wishes and character felt than by clamouring for votes there are cases where womanly charm may be the companion of settled opinions and convictions and clear purposes to which the morning post of to-day is a witness one factor in the success of the paper was oliver borthwick the son of lord glenesk journalism attracted him he entered his father's office early his aptitudes for the business showed themselves at once and before many years he was managing editor he had an inquiring inventive mind he kept his conservatism for politics and applied to the conduct of the morning post the most original and even radical and sometimes daring methods he understood details and thought no detail beneath the notice of a manager he liked to do things which the old hands in the office pronounced impossible among them that paged index to the contents of the paper which he first believed and then proved to be practicable all this did not stand in the way of broad conceptions and great schemes for which his father gave him a free hand lord glenis asked me one day if oliver had told me of his newest plan i said no well you had better ask him about it i shall not interfere though it is going to cost a lot of money 
and he named a sum which ran into many figures those were the relations which existed between father and son but there came a day when they existed no longer oliver borthwick's joy in his work was such that he never spared himself and he died at thirty-two his father still living the only gift he lacked was the gift of adapting his work to his strength he overworked recklessly he could not do otherwise he would spare everybody but himself and so to-day instead of being an ornament of his profession and of social life oliver borthwick is only a memory and a lasting regret since the foregoing was written mr reginald lucas has published his lord glenisk and the morning post an agreeable and informing book this is not the place to comment on it but i should like to add to what i have said above of lord glenisk a passage from a signed review by me in the morning post as i think of the man whom i knew the importance of the things he did great and brilliant as they were seems to me less than the importance of the man himself if i could i should like to describe not what he did but what he was i would say that his friendships to which i have already referred were part not only of his life but of himself the range of them would show that Political friendships came to him in his position as a matter of course, but friendships non-political were more numerous and more remarkable still. The late Queen's regard for him was a strong one. Early in life he was the friend of that astonishing Frenchwoman, Elizabeth Rachel Felix, more commonly known as Rachel, perhaps the greatest tragedian of all time, in almost the full flower of her genius at seventeen later in life he was the friend the very helpful and trusted friend of madame sarah bernhardt he early conceived and retained to the end an affection for the french emperor i need not go on with the catalogue but there are many friends not to be named who were under obligation to him for kindnesses and whom he seems to have liked because he had helped them all through life that was true he gave freely generously delicately nihil humane was his motto or one of his mottoes there must have been many a life so varied as his does not move to the music of a single air on a single string not the briefest and not even the most public notice of lord glenis can omit all reference to the happiness of his private life even the few lines above may show what part his wife had in his happiness and he in hers of his daughter lady bathurst mr lucas has told us something with due reserve enough to give his readers at least a hint of the affection between her and her father and why it was on both sides so deep and is on hers so abiding oliver was to all the world a beloved and brilliant figure and when the time came his father's right hand then finally relieving him of his executive cares then at thirty-two came the end and then the father at seventy-five takes up the burden once more and not for long mr lucas tells us that president roosevelt's manner of receiving oliver was particularly flattering i hope it may interest his friends if i enlarge that a little oliver told me when he came to washington that he had the usual introduction from the british ambassador which is indispensable and asked me what he had better do he wished something more than a formal interview as one of the many whom it was the president's habit to receive in line bestowing a few cordial but conventional words on each i saw the president that afternoon told him something of oliver's position and of oliver himself he answered bring him to lunch to-morrow at lunch the president put him next to himself and the two talked together during and after this meal then oliver and i walked away he said the president is a great natural force a phrase which recalls lord morley's later remark that the two greatest natural phenomena he had seen in the united states were niagara and president roosevelt the day following i again saw the president who perhaps will for once allow himself to be quoted he said your friend oliver bothwick is a very young man but a man then a pause then 
and what charm he has it is long since i have met any newcomer whom i have liked better End of chapter 35chapter thirty six of anglo-american memories by george washburn smalley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty six queen victoria at balmoral king edward at dunrobin admiral sir hedworth lambton other anecdotes embercald of which lord glenesk was long tenant lies near balmoral a name famous the world over as the highland home of queen victoria and then of the late king a castle on which the very german taste of the very german husband of the great queen has left its mark it is no more a fine castle than buckingham palace is a fine palace it stands however in a beautiful country and some of the best drives within easy reach are those on the invercald property they are private but all gates swing open to kings and queens the privacy was one thing the queen liked so long as she was in the highlands the loyalty of her subjects was expected to manifest itself by ignoring her presence if you saw the sovereign approaching you effaced yourself you slipped behind a tree or looked over the hedge or retied your shoelaces you might do anything except be aware of this august lady's presence and recognize it by the usual salute and the bared head as she went by the queen was ever as her son was insistent upon etiquette no form of ceremony must be neglected but at balmoral the etiquette consisted in the absence of all form or ceremony outdoors you were expected to know this and if you did not know it but stood at attention with lifted hat this mark of homage would not be well received i once heard a stranger who had offended in this way say that the look upon the queen's face as she passed was a lesson not to be forgotten her majesty drove quietly about in a pony carriage with perhaps the ever faithful john brown in attendance to lay a shawl about her shoulders or take one off as he judged best you might see him do as much as that in the publicity of hyde park in london it was partly in the simplicity of this highland life that the queen found repose her majesty would sometimes stop at invercald house for tea apparently as one neighbour appealing to the hospitality of another but i imagine these impulses were announced beforehand and that the list of guests at invercald was known at balmoral during one week there was among them a lady who for purely technical reasons was never received at court though she went almost everywhere else in london and had and has a position almost unique but so long as this lady remained at invercald house the queen found herself too much occupied with business of state to come to tea royalty knows or knows about almost everybody the late king was always the best informed man in his dominions it was rare that he met a man or woman whose face and history were not familiar to him he did once at dunrobin castle this was not many years ago when the king and queen were circumnavigating this island part of their empire in the royal yacht the yacht anchored for some days in the bay off the castle the king or queen or both came ashore during the day and returned to sleep on board as the king the duke of sutherland and captain hedworth lambton commander of the yacht were walking up from the pier through the gardens to the castle a man passed them who is that asked the king the duke had to admit he could not tell oh sir said captain lambton don't you know the castle is full of people whom the duke doesn't know and the duchess never sees the king took this pleasantry as it was meant aware that there was beneath it just that evanescent adumbration of fact which made it plausible captain lambton then the honourable hedworth lambton brother to the present earl of durham is now admiral the honourable sir hedworth lambton k c b the youngest man of his rank in the service or was when he was made admiral noted for the quaint felicity of his sayings sometimes with an edge to them noted for his service with the naval brigade in south africa and the relief of ladysmith 
noted as a skilful seaman who had commanded the cruiser division of the mediterranean fleet and afterward the china squadron the lamptons are a family apart and sir hedworth is a man apart even amid his own family there are few men who give you a stronger impression of having made their own that rule of life which consists in taking things as they come struggling through the watercourses of the veldt with his four point ten gun or on the quarter-deck of the royal yacht in harbour with only duties of ceremony to perform he was the same man he came to Dalmany House for the weekend while the Victoria and Albert was lying at Queen's Ferry. On the Sunday morning he asked Lord Rosebery and his house party to go with him to the yacht for morning service. We drove through the charming park to the Lichfield Gate and so to Queen's Ferry Pier, whence a launch took us on board. The yacht has a displacement of something more than 5,000 tons those external lines of beauty which you expect in a yacht had been omitted by the admiralty designers responsible for this vessel but once on board everything is admirable the ship was lying in the fourth above the bridge waiting for queen alexandra to embark for copenhagen nothing could be smarter than the decks and crew except the officers all in full uniform it was august and though some americans say the sun never shines on these islands there are moments of exception and this was one it was burning hot captain lambton read the service his officers and guests about him the men in front all amidships on the upper deck he came to the lord's prayer the sailors all kneeling and all caps off in the very middle of it without a change of intonation or accent he said to his men if anybody feels the sun they may put their caps on i suppose a super devout churchman might have been shocked but the reader was captain of the ship and he had no idea of allowing one of his men to have a touch of sunstroke it appears they were in no danger for not one of them put on his cap nor did any one seem to think his captain's interlocutory sentence out of place. I have seen often enough, both in the Navy and in the Army, that the most rigid disciplinarian may be, of all others, the most careful of his men's health and comfort. In these dreadnought days, nothing of the pre-dreadnought period counts. But I was once on, I believe, the first dreadnought of a type long since antiquated with a low freeboard forward and the whole expanse of the forecastle deck so arranged as to be with reference to the rest of the vessel a lever on which the atlantic might pile itself up i asked the captain what might happen in a heavy head sea the chances are he answered coolly she would go down head foremost however at the moment she was comfortably anchored off queen's ferry that danger exists no longer for the model is obsolete and this particular ship no doubt went long since to the scrap heap but the unsolved problems of naval warfare are still numerous a fighting admiral in the british navy will tell you strange things if he happens to be in a talkative mood nothing is better worth listening to than the discourse of a man who has command of a great fleet or of a great ship whether of war or commerce i quote one sentence you want to know what is likely to happen when two modern battle fleets meet at sea equal in fighting strength and under equal conditions no man knows it has never yet happened but the chances are both would go to the bottom out of many highland incidents i choose one for brevity's sake invermark a place renowned for many kinds of sport salmon fishing included it belonged when i knew it to the late lord dalhousie who generally led it and confined himself to brecon castle with excursions to panmer house invermark was a lodge and nothing more just room for half a dozen guests and their guns and servants lord dudley and the late lord hindlop had it together one year lord hindlop was the head of the great brewery firm of alsop and company he announced to us one night at dinner that he must go to london next morning on business he went returning two days later he had spent twelve hours in london somebody said i hope your business turned out all right lord hindlip answered i don't know about all right i bought seven hundred and fifty thousand pounds 
three million seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of hops a price which makes it impossible there should be any profit in the next twelve months brewing nobody asked but everybody looked another question then why buy lord hindlip continued his sentence as if he had not noticed our curiosity but if i had not bought yesterday there would have been no brewing of beer at all for the next twelve months or perhaps ever this was one of the houses perhaps only those belonging to the great brewers where beer was served with the cheese instead of port but not the kind of beer known to the ordinary mortal beer especially brewed long kept tenderly cared for and somehow transformed into a transcendental fluid transparent golden in colour nectar to the taste strangely mild on the palate but swiftly finding its way to the brain if you were ensnared into drinking a tumblerful there was nothing to warn you unless your host warned you which he generally did not he perhaps rather pressed it upon you as they do the audit ale at trinity college cambridge with a hospitality not free from guile that i knew through the late mr justice denham who was my host and when i resisted he told me how lord chancellor campbell had praised the mildness of the ale and had a second drink and then a third and upon emerging from the buttery into the fresh air found himself embarrassed he the hardest head at the bar of his time a story which i hand on as a warning to the next comer End of chapter thirty six Chapter thirty seven of Anglo American Memories by George Washburn Smalley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty seven Famous Englishmen Not in Politics. One. There are perhaps a few names of today which it is possible to mention without becoming involved in the politics of today. The English, it is true, draw a broader line between what is purely political and what is personal than we do. They can give and take hard knocks, whether in Parliament or on the platform, or even in the press, without animosity or resentment. But since in America it seems to be supposed that any reference to these encounters may have its danger side, I avoid them for the present. I turn away from the revolutionary present, of which one stock of memories increases day by day, to the more peaceful past or to a more peaceful world in the present a world unravaged by political passions true the past was not always a peaceful past while it lasted we do not always remember how fierce were the storms which have subsided but where death has made a solitude we call it peace in two at least of the great contest waged these periods of peace i had to share which i must mention again for the sake of another story i have to tell one was the conflict about Irish home rule, which became critical and revolutionary in 1881 and 1886. When I was allowed to state my own views, unpopular as they were in America, in the Tribune, week by week or day by day, a policy of generous and far-sighted courage on the part of that journal, honourable to its editor, and I hope in the long run not injurious to the paper, the second was in 1895 and 1896 in the Times of London, when President Cleveland flung his message of war upon the floor of the House at Washington in December 1895, I necessarily had much to say about it in the Times. There again I was given a free hand. It is sometimes said that the correspondents of this journal frame their news dispatches in accordance with orders issued to them from the Home Office. I can only say, if indeed I may say so, much without violating obligations of secrecy, that during a service which lasted ten years, I never knew of or heard of any such orders. Coming to England in the summer of 1896 on a holiday, I had some slight illness and asked a friend whom I should consult. My own doctor was by that time attending patients, I suppose, in another and better world my friend said he had lately seen fourteen physicians about his son and each of the fourteen had given a different name to his son's disease 
then i went to dr barlow who said after a long examination i do not know what is the matter with your son nor what to prescribe for him then i felt i had found a doctor whom i could trust so i went to dr barlow without an introduction at the end of a rather long consultation and a definite opinion and a settled prescription i asked what his fee was nothing i thought he had misunderstood my question and repeated it nothing i can take no money from a man who has done as much as you have to keep the peace between the two countries when i next saw the manager of the times i told him of this incident which he seemed to think interesting he said such evidences of good feeling from a man so distinguished as barlow and so far removed from politics do indeed make for good feeling on both sides i hope you will tell all your own people it is difficult for i cannot tell it without more or less directly paying a compliment to myself but many years have since ebbed away modesty is at best but an inconvenient and maiden from whom i would part company if i could let her keep to her proper place an obligation of honour is peremptory and this perhaps is one i did tell a certain number of friends at the time and now i repeat the anecdote to a larger number i said it against mr price collier's mischievous dictum that english and americans do not like each other the dictum already seems to belong to a distant and misty and mythical past since that year of eighteen ninety six dr barlow has become in nineteen o two sir thomas barlow bart and physician to the king's household about as high as anybody can go in the medical profession a lancashire lad to begin with he has had a vast hospital experience and still keeps up his hospital work he has a vast private practice harvard and two canadian universities have given him their l l d he is an f r s and a k c v o and other parts of the alphabet pay him tribute all these and many other titles and distinctions have their value though the late sir henry drummond wolfe who had more than most men did say they give me every kind of letter to my name except l s d but the essential thing in sir thomas barlow's case is that he has the confidence of the public and of his profession one thing it seems to me the great surgeons and physicians i have known had in common they were great men first of all they had great qualities outside of their profession two years ago last september a time when the big men are mostly away i wanted a surgeon and knew not where to find one a chemist finally gave me a name mr henry morris and an address name wholly unknown to me though the address cavendish square implied at least professional prosperity i had had a fall at the playhouse as mr maud calls his little theatre the night before leaving a box by what i supposed to be steps and in the absence of steps coming down on the floor bruised and i knew not what else my surgeon made his examination what struck me was that he wasted never a word nor a gesture the touch of his hands of his fingers had a mathematical or instrumental precision so had his questions in five minutes or less he had covered the ground and delivered his opinion anything might have happened but nothing had barred the bruised muscles we'll attend to those for you he asked if i was leaving town and when i said i was sailing for new york on saturday he remarked if you were a working man i should send you to the hospital and you would be kept in bed till you were well but if you choose to sail on the lusitania you must bear the pain now as you are here you might as well let me overhaul you then as before the same precision the same delicacy of touch the same rapidity nothing hurried nothing missed his examination a work of art as well as of science then he began to talk of other things and again and even stronger was the impression of being in contact with a master mind seldom have i spent a more stimulating hour he was i found later mr henry morris consulting surgeon to the middlesex hospital and president of the royal college of surgeons in other words mr henry morris about whom i ought to have known but did not was and is in the very front rank of his profession 
His eminence has since been recognized and rewarded by the king, and he is now Sir Henry Morris Bart. I suppose even a Republican may admit that if titles are to be conferred, they are well conferred on men eminent in science. 2. Sir Thomas Barlow has since been elected President of the Royal College of Physicians in succession to Sir Douglas Powell. This is the blue ribbon of the profession, perhaps a greater honour than a knighthood or baronetcy, though the knighthood or the baronetcy is from the king, the source and fountain of all such distinctions. But the presidency of the Royal College of Physicians is conferred by the profession itself. The fellows of the college, who number some three hundred, are the choosing body. They vote by ballot, and the man whom they elect is the man by whom they wish to be represented before the public, the man by whom they are content to be judged. They say, in effect, of him whom they choose, this is the head of the medical profession for the time being. The public, which really and rightly has much more confidence in the judgment of the doctors upon each other than in any lay reputation, accepts that, when you say of a physician, he is a doctor's doctor, you have said about all you can. The president of the Royal College of Physicians has, no doubt, duties which are not medical. He has executive, administrative, consultative duties, and the very important duty of dining with the Lord Mayor, the Corporation of the City of London, and the City Companies. In discharging these latter functions, he incurs, I suppose, less risk than most men incur. But risk or no risk, these feasts have to be faced. Between all corporations, guilds, and colleges, there is a kind of Freemasonry. They have points of contact, of sympathy, and are likely to stand by each other in difficulties. Whether dinners are invented as a test and standard of friendship, I cannot say. But go to which of them you like, you will find a collection of the heads of other companies, colleges, etc. Not all, perhaps, dinner-giving, but all willing victims of others' hospitality. The Royal College of Physicians is also a Senate or Parliament, with powers of legislation and of professional guidance and discipline. The fellows of this college are trustees for the whole profession. The President has an authority of his own, depending in part on statutes and on custom, in part on his personal authority. In the latter, Sir Thomas Barlow will not be found wanting. It is not the less, it is perhaps the greater, for the genial good nature which accompanies it. I said to him once, Sir Thomas, you have one quality which must be a great drawback to your success. Dear me, what is that? When you come into a room, your patient at once thinks himself better, and even doubts whether he need have sent for you at all, and so gets well much quicker than he ought. It's taking money out of your pocket. Oh, very good. I'll take care you don't get well too soon. There was an electioneering story. Oh, no politics in it. The other day, with an equally serious, but not more serious, side to it. Men were discussing the system of plural voting still prevailing in this country, and certain to prevail so long as votes, or any votes, are based on property qualification said a well-known doctor, I have sixteen votes, all of which I'm going to poll. But how? Oh, I have two votes of my own, and I have fourteen patients who are of the wrong party, and not one of them will be well enough to go out till after election. Think how completely non-political must be a profession of which an eminent member can tell a story like that and run no risk of being misunderstood. The traditions of honour are indeed high among English doctors, nor could they be in better keeping than now in Sir Thomas Barlow's. One of his predecessors, Sir William Gull, was also not merely fashionable and popular, but recognised by his associates as a scientific practitioner. Sir William Jenner was perhaps reckoned by the medical profession the best all-round man ever known. Sir William Gull was not far off, yet there is an anecdote of him which suggests that he put a very high value on the average capacity of doctors. He was asked to go a long distance into the country to see a patient. He declined. He was told that any fee he liked to name would be gladly paid. 
Still he declined, saying there were cases he could not leave, and when he was pressed further, the great man burst out, But why do you want me? There are five hundred doctors in London just as good as I am. Which perhaps was not quite true. Sir William Broadbent said almost the same thing to me twenty years ago and more when I asked him to see Mr. Hay, whom I had just left in his rooms in Ryder Street, St. James, to all appearance extremely ill. Hay said in his emotional way, Broadbent is the only doctor I believe in. If you don't bring Broadbent, bring nobody. Let me die. But Broadbent said no. He was starting to catch a train for a life-and-death consultation in the country. He must not miss his train. But there's time enough. See Hay on your way to the train. Give him five minutes and let somebody else do the rest. I shall let somebody else do the whole. Hay will see nobody unless he sees you first. There are plenty of men as good as I am. I will give you half a dozen names. I want none of them. I want you. You know you can stop your carriage for five minutes as you drive to the station. My carriage has not come round. My hansom is at the door. Drive with me and let your carriage follow. Finally he did. When he came out of Hay's bedroom, he was a very angry man. He said, Your friend has a bad attack of indigestion. He'll be all right in an hour and away he went. An angry man is not always a just man. Hay, God bless his memory, thought himself suffering from a heart attack. There is, I believe, a medical analogy between the symptoms of heart disease and violent indigestion. I had left him lying on the floor almost in convulsions. How was he to know it was not heart disease to which he believed himself subject? Hay was not then to the English so great a man as he afterwards became. He had not been ambassador, nor secretary of state, nor dictated to the European powers a new policy in the East. I ought not to use the word dictated. It is not descriptive of Hay's methods, which were persuasive. Nor does one power dictate to another. Let us say he had secured, by the adroit use of accepted diplomatic methods, the adhesions of the European powers to his proposals in respect of China. No American Secretary of State had ever made so original or beneficent a use of his power. He had brought his country once for all into the great world partnership of great powers the world over. Sir William Broadbent did not foresee that. He could not. If he had, he might have been less angry, for he was thought to be considerate of greatness in all its forms, or in many of them. He liked patience of distinction, which is no reproach. He had many of them. But the odd thing was that he seemed never quite able to overcome his awe of rank and title. In a company of persons of rank, his manner was not that of an equal. He used to address persons of rank as a servant addresses them, or it might be kinder to say, as inferiors in position used to address their superiors two or three generations ago, and always with embarrassment. Another celebrated man of medicine, Sir Andrew Clark, had an almost factitious renown as Mr. Gladstone's doctor, and Mr. Gladstone was a very good patient in one sense. One thing this famous physician had, he had absolute confidence in himself. Or, if no doctor has that, he had enough to give his patient confidence, which is perhaps not less important. Old Abernathy used to say, The second best remedy is best if the patient thinks it best. And I suppose that is as true of doctors as of remedies. If Sir Andrew doubted, he never allowed you to see that he doubted, like all these great men, he had a social as well as medical popularity, and he was very good company at dinner and after. One evening I met him at a pleasant house where there was a good cook, and the company, including the host, did not exceed six, all men. We all noticed that Sir Andrew drank champagne. Presently one of the men said, "'You don't allow us champagne, Sir Andrew, but you allow it to yourself.' Oh, I have had a long day, and I am very tired, and I must have it. Besides, when I get home, there will be thirty or forty letters to answer. So the champagne flowed on, like the water, as Mr. Everts said, at one of President Hayes' White House dinners. Sir Andrew drank no more than anybody else. 
it was only because of his habit of prohibiting it to others that we noticed whether his glass was full or empty as we went upstairs i said to him do you mean that after all that champagne you are going to answer thirty or forty letters when you get home no certainly not then what did you mean what i meant was that after my champagne i should not care whether they are answered or not it was sir andrew clark who said of mr gladstone some fifteen years before his death at eighty-eight that there was no physiological reason why he should not live to be a hundred and twenty if that was meant as a prophecy it had the fate of most prophecies End of chapter thirty seven chapter thirty eight of anglo-american memories by george washburn smalley this LibriVox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty eight lord st hillier american and english methods mr benjamin if you care for a clear view of english life and of englishmen you need not always go to the mountain tops in search of it if you can find a man who stands for what is typical who is in the front rank but not among the very foremost who has in a high degree the qualities by which the average englishman having them in a much less degree succeeds he is as well worth studying for this purpose as the most illustrious of them all i could name many such men i will take one whom i knew well for many years to whose kindness i owed much whom i saw often in london and stayed with often in the country for whose memory i have that kind of affection which survives even a sense of many obligations i mean lord st hillier he was mr francis jeune when i first knew him and when he married mrs stanley later he became sir francis jeune and finally found his way into that house of lords which it is now the fashion among one set of politicians to decry i suppose nobody would deny that whatever be the merits or demerits of the hereditary principle this house contains more distinguished and supremely able men than any other body that can be named for such a man as francis jeune it was the natural and preordained abode when his honourable career reached or approached its climax sir francis jeune was a man who made the most of his abilities and opportunities he was a good lawyer a good judge and after his marriage with mrs stanley a considerable social force it is among the peculiarities of english life that the presidency of the divorce court should be one of four great prizes at the english bar the lord high chancellor the lord chief justice and the master of the rolls hold the other three most coveted places and are rewarded by appointments such as the legal profession in no other country can hope for the dignity of all these positions is very great and the pay corresponds to the dignity if we contrast the splendid figures with the salaries of the judges of the supreme court at the united states the motto of the republic would seem to be hamlet's thrift thrift horatio but if the levelling doctrines of the present day were to prevail the british judges would soon descend to the money level of the american i do not imagine they will the illiberal treatment of public servants has never been popular in england there is nevertheless something in these high legal posts which attracts men to whom the pay high as it is can be no attraction but that again only sharpens the contrast the average income of the magnates at the american bar being greater than at the english and the salaries of the american judges being less than half those of the english judges why should an american lawyer of the first class ever accept a judicial office clearly there are other and higher motives than mere money there are americans we are told who recognize in american life no motive higher than money but are they americans or are they of the true american type you might have asked mr roosevelt when he was here last may he is the most famous of living americans and he certainly did not become so by the worship of money i have strayed far from sir francis jeune but the law and the things of the law must ever have an attraction for any one who has at any time no matter how long ago been in contact with them otherwise than as a client 
and i will stray further still in order to add that one of the greatest names at the english bar and now one of the greatest memories is that of an american i mean of course mr benjamin he had no superior it is doubtful whether he had an equal in those duties of his profession in which he most cared to excel i knew him a little he sometimes talked to me of his career surely the most remarkable at the english or perhaps any other bar since he was fifty-three when he came to this country he always acknowledged heartily the kindness shown him the facilities given him the aid even of men who foresaw in him a dangerous rival to make his path smooth i said to him once but you came here as the representative of a lost cause which the english had at one time almost made their own that may have helped oh no the friendship of the governing classes in england for the confederacy had passed into history they had discovered their mistake as they would say they had backed the wrong horse it was still some years to the geneva arbitration but they had begun to be aware they would have to pay as others do when they put their money on a loser however i don't think that counted one way or the other what did count was the good will of english lawyers to another lawyer that you can always depend on they shortened the formalities they opened the doors as wide as they could and never once when i had gained a foothold did i find that anybody remembered i was not english or remembered it to my disadvantage taking his place as he did at the very head he was a memorable illustration of daniel webster's well-known reply to the young lawyer who asked him if the profession was not overcrowded there is always room at the top mr benjamin passed swiftly from penury to affluence he told me once what his highest earnings in any one year had been the amount was larger by many thousands of pounds than the income of his chief competitor it was larger i think than any english lawyer now makes except at the parliamentary bar where the figures are almost fantastic this is a money test but apply any other you like and you would still see the figure of mr benjamin standing out from among the crowd and high above it and above even the highest of that day i dined lately at the inner temple as the guest of a great and successful lawyer there was a company of other successful lawyers and of judges i asked a question or two about benjamin in that perfectly rarefied legal atmosphere there could be none but a purely legal opinion and there was but one opinion most of these men had known him though benjamin died in eighteen eighty four whether they knew him or not they knew all about him his greatness was admitted eulogies were poured out on him did his american nationality hinder him it neither hindered nor helped he was at the english bar and that was enough i come back to sir francis jeune he was the friend and legal adviser of lord beaconsfield whose will he drew a conservative of course his practice at the bar was never of a showy kind but if you put yourself into his hands you felt sure he would do the right and wise thing his mind was of the sort known as legal when he came to the bench it was seen to be judicial also i suppose the general public has never understood why probate divorce and admiralty should be united in one division of the supreme court no two subjects could be more unlike than divorce and admiralty but a judge is supposed to have taken all legal knowledge to be his province and to be equally capable of dealing with all the mysteries of the law in all its relations to all parts of life it is true that on the admiralty side assessors are called in an assessor is a kind of expert a retired sea captain for example who has never commanded anything but a sailing ship is supposed to be competent to advise on the most intricate questions of modern steamship navigation the result is sometimes astounding as in the case of the campagna condemned by mr justice garrell barnes to pay for the loss of the bark in bolton by collision solely because she was steaming nine knots it was proved that this was the safest speed for her and for all comers that she was under better control at nine knots than any at any less speed but the court said 
if people will build ships which are safest at nine knots they must be responsible for the consequences sir francis jeune had no part in the trial of this famous cause and i am sure had too much sense to agree with the judgment good sense was perhaps the predominant trait in his character he showed it preeminently in the divorce court there he was helped no doubt by his social experiences he knew london as few men knew it he had in such matters almost feminine instincts but he ruled in his court as all strong english judges rule and as strong american judges do not in america we say of an advocate he tried such and such a case in england the phrase is never used of the barrister it is the judge who tries the cause as it ought to be sir francis tried the causes that came before him he knew the law he mastered facts easily he was not easily misled and he had the sagacity which led him quickly to right conclusions since his death there have been contrasts on which i will not dwell End of chapter 38Chapter thirty nine of Anglo American Memories by George Washburn Smalley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty nine Mrs. Jeune, Lady Jeune, and Lady St. Hilier. The interesting people are the exceptional people, not those cast in a mould common to others, but those whose lives run in a groove, but those who fashion their own lives in obedience to the dictates of a nature which is their own among the women of london it would be easy to choose those of higher rank or greater position than lady st hilier but i choose her because she is lady st hilier whether the marriage of mrs stanley to mr francis jeune in eighteen eighty one was or was not considered a social event of the first importance i cannot say i was not then in london but that it became important in no long time is clear it was first as mrs jeune and then as lady jeune that the present lady st hilier achieved her great distinction as a hostess she was not content to do what other ladies of position were in the habit of doing she struck out a line for herself i said lately that london was a world in which everything of the first rank in many differing ranks and professions met at times beneath the same roofs that was not always true it was very far from being true if you go back no further than the eighteenth century you find in england a society consisting of perhaps three hundred or four hundred persons if we may judge by the memoirs and memories that have come down to us it was a very brilliant society perhaps more brilliant though less varied than the society of to-day but it was not comprehensive still less was it cosmopolitan it was a caste the hereditary principle prevailed it was a society into which you had to take the precaution to be born if you were not born into it you never found your way in there was no effort to keep people outside of it none was required the people who were outside did not dream of forcing themselves in there was no reason why this little clique should be on the defence the climbers did not then exist as an aggressive body or as a force of any kind if you read boswell's life or walpole's letters or the life of selwyn or any political memoirs of the time it is clear that the dividing line between those who were in society and those who were not was a broad one and was all but impassable it has long ceased to be and the steps by which it was worn away can be traced but if we come at once to the eighties of the last century we see a condition of things which a hundred years before that would have seemed to the social leaders of that day fantastic the revolution had gone far it had already become an evolution and of course the end was not yet it needed a mrs jeune to carry it on to its full development and since the individual is but one expression of those natural forces which are in such cases the operative forces there is no reason why nature should not supply the individual as she does the other energies needed for the work she has in mind at any rate she supplied mrs jeune and london is to-day a different place from the london we should have known had there been no mrs jeune 
for society in the mixed form now prevailing is supposed to be not only a compromise between conflicting forces but the result of much careful diplomacy lady jersey was a diplomatist lady palmerston was a diplomatist the late king was preeminently a diplomatist whether from temperament or calculation i know not but mrs jeune cast diplomacy to the winds the one gift which stood to her in the place of all others was courage she brought together at the same table or under the same roof at arlington manor people the most unlike each one of her guests had some kind of distinction or some claim to social recognition they might or might not have anything in common mrs george cornwallis west whom we still think of as lady randolph churchill once gave at her house in connaught place by the marble arch looking out on hyde park what she called a dinner of deadly enemies it was thought a hazardous experiment it proved a complete success they were all well-bred people they all recognized their obligations to their hostess as paramount for the time being they were lady randolph's guests that was enough as guests they were neither friends nor enemies there were no hostilities the talk flowed on smoothly when a man found himself sent in to dinner with a woman to whom he did not speak his tongue was somehow unloosed it was a truce in some cases ancient animosities were softened in all they were suspended the guests all knew each other and as they looked about the table they all saw that lady randolph had attempted the impossible and had conquered a social miracle had been performed what lady randolph did for that one evening mrs jeune did night after night and year after year there was not on her part i presume any conscious intention of bringing irreconcilables into contact with each other what mrs jeune did was simply to take no note of the fact that they were irreconcilables her policy if policy it were had therefore the kind of validity which comes to a man or to a woman from not appearing to be aware of the obvious that is a great resource in debate and a great resource in that larger debate which broadens into human intercourse the average man is rather apt to do what he sees is expected of him as a guest he has hardly a choice when he enters a front door he puts himself under the dominion of his hostess if he is a man of the world his philosophy is to take what is offered him if he is not he is chiefly concerned to do as others do whom he supposes to be more familiar than himself with the manners and customs of society very rarely therefore does anything like a collision occur and almost never so long as the company is of two sexes mrs jeune may or may not have thought this out or she may have acted from those intuitions which in women supply the place of reason and are for all social purposes and some others more useful than reason people who did not like her used to say that all she cared for was to get celebrities together they professed to think she was a mrs leo hunter and her collections of guests so many menageries if that had been so they would soon have been dispersed nor would mrs jeune or the lady jeune of later days or the present lady st hillier ever have attained to the rank she did as hostess she offered society what nobody else offered novelty which is the one thing society craves beyond all others said a man who went everywhere i go to lady jeune's because i never know whom i shall meet but i know there will always be somebody i shall like to meet by the side of which i will set an anecdote not unlike it at a dinner i was next a lady who knew everybody and there was a man at table whom she did not know she asked who is that mr justice stephen why have i never seen him he looks a man everybody ought to know but it is a rare pleasure to meet somebody you do not know i will give the other side in another anecdote a smart party a stream of guests coming up a famous staircase two in a balcony looking down on the arrivals he who is that she i don't know he but you know everybody she nobody knows everybody there spoke the voice of authority 
society in london is now so multitudinous that even a bowing acquaintance between its less conspicuous members is not universal it was lady jeune's mission to bring together those who stood apart she swept into her net many a foreigner who but for her might have remained a foreigner i will venture to guess that lady st hillier's invitation was one of the few unofficial invitations which mr roosevelt accepted for his brief stay in london they met twenty years ago or more when mr roosevelt was in london and made friends he used to make friendly inquiries about mr jeune as mr jeune did about him year by year and i often carried friendly messages from each to the other she will surround him with delightful people, among whom there will be one or two or three he had never heard of, and when he has met them will wonder he had not known them always. Lady St. Hillier has published a book of reminiscences, which I have not yet read. I am therefore borrowing a little of her courage, and giving my own account of some matters which she may have dealt with, and perhaps from a different point of view. But I must take that risk. I prefer taking it if my testimony or anybody's testimony is to have any value it must be from its independence mrs jeune lived for many years in wimpole street then moved to harley street and then after lord st hillier's death in nineteen o five to portland place their place in the country was arlington manor near newbury in berkshire the scene of the battle in sixteen forty three in which lord falkland despairing of peace says his biographer threw his life away there stands a monument on the battlefield erected not many years ago with an inscription by the late lord carnarvon himself a kind of nineteenth century falkland who threw away his political future in an impossible attempt to come to terms with mr parnell lord carnarvon also despairing of peace the inscription is a piece of literature forever at arlington it was lady jeune's delight to gather about her some of the men and women she really liked and who really liked her the house was not large and was devoid of all other splendour than such as the beauty of its position and view and park and gardens gave it but it was the home of comfort and charm now it has passed into other hands and lady st hillier has built herself another house known as cold ash but the memories of Arlington will never pass. Perhaps it was in Arlington that Lady Jeune's gifts as hostess were to be seen at their best. It is one thing to take charge of a dinner, another to handle a difficult team from Saturday to Monday, or often longer. Freedom of choice is a thing which has to be paid for, but to her this was no task. She had good hands and a touch so delicate that you were guided without knowing you had a bit in your mouth it was a skill which all depended on kindness and sympathy and these belonged to her in overflowing measure end of chapter thirty nine chapter forty of anglo-american memories by george washburn smalley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter forty lord and lady arthur russell and the salon in england the recent death of lady arthur russell diminished by one the number of accomplished women of this generation who were distinguished in the last generation also and it closed one of the few drawing-rooms in london which have been salon as well as drawing-room i suppose lady arthur herself might have said as she looked about her and looked back tout passe the french phrase would have come naturally to her tongue for she was French, daughter of that Vicomte de Parnay, who was minister to Charles X. Yet one was not often, at any rate not too often, reminded of her French origin. So long ago as 1865, Mademoiselle de Parinette married Lord Arthur Russell, brother of the ninth Duke of Bedford, and of the more famous Lord Odo Russell, afterward the first Lord Amptill, long british ambassador at berlin where he managed to be on good terms both with prince bismarck and the present emperor a feat of diplomacy almost unique it is eighteen years since lord arthur died 
he was indisputably of the last or an earlier generation having little in common with the present people thought of lord and lady arthur as one of itself enough to identify them with earlier times than those when husband and wife are as likely to be met separately as together if there was a distinction it was at the breakfast hour at breakfasts in other houses there was no rule which excluded ladies from these breakfasts but there was a custom which held good in the majority of cases the host's wife if he had one might or might not appear but the group of men who were in the habit of breakfasting at each other's houses included lord arthur russell sir montstuart grant duff lord rie mr charles rondell mr albert rutson sometimes mr herbert spencer and many more you will recognize sir montserrat grant duff's name as that of the most voluminous diarist of his time and when you have read his six or seven volumes the map of his life is spread before you an honoured and useful life a career of real distinction lord arthur had not sir montserrat's ambitions he was content with his home and his kin and his books his brother the duke had a habit of referring to himself as hastings russell an alteration at woburn abbey was proposed to him it will not be made in the lifetime of hastings russell his answer he had a sense of humour which lloyd george must think a rare thing in a duke i drove once from montmore to woburn abbey with lady rosebury and her little girl lady sybil then eight or nine years old with a gift of humorous perception rare at any age in her sex the child had a balanced mind and a mature view of things which might have belonged to eighteen as well as eight the old place interested her and she asked the duke to show her the whole he was delighted and took us through room after room each stately and each a museum presently we came to a rather bare scantily furnished unhandsome room and lady sybil asked but what is this this my dear is where i earn my living writing cheques for six hours a day all three brothers the duke lord odo and lord arthur had a quiet humour in common lord odo had besides humour wit it was he while ambassador in berlin and during a visit of the shah when that great potentate practised a less strict abstinence at dinner than his religion demanded who said to a neighbour after all it's nothing wonderful you must remember the proverb la nuit tous les chats sont ease and berlin used to echo with his caustic good-natured speeches nor did berlin nor perhaps london ever forget prince bismarck saying i never knew an englishman who spoke french well whom i would trust except lord odo after which i dare not name two or three others whose french was not less perfect than that which prince bismarck praised the prince was a good judge as well he might be french had become to him almost a second mother tongue as indeed it must be to a european diplomatist to the list of men who were to be met in those days at breakfast the name of mr george broderick ought to be added he was a scholar a writer a journalist and one of those men who never could understand why the world would not come round to his way of thinking and to him he had real abilities which survived a university education he was born into a respectable place in the world of good family with good opportunities but was never a man of the world to be of the world in the true sense of the phrase a man must i take it have a fairly accurate notion of his relation to the world that broderick had not his ambitions were political and most of all parliamentary but they remained ambitions he could not understand how to commend himself to a constituency nor would he ever have conformed to the inexorable standards of the house of commons he expected the house and its standards to conform to him struggling with a fine courage for the unattainable mr roderick meantime occupied himself with journalism 
and was for many years a leader writer on the times the story which points his intense self-concentration as well as any other connects itself with that period he was a guest in a house in scotland and while there continued composition of those more or less adithonian and rather academic essays which when printed on the leader page of the thunderer became leaders and very good leaders of their kind he saw fit to write them in the drawing-room and in the morning when men are commonly supposed to be elsewhere there were ladies and they talked presently mr broderick rose marched over to his hostess and said to her lady x i really must ask you to ask these ladies not to carry on their conversation in this room i am engaged upon a most important article and my thoughts are distracted by talk which has no importance at all his appearance and dress were those of a man who gave no thought to either he was rather tall angular uncouth a stoop in the shoulders and his figure consisted of k's he had the projecting teeth which french caricaturists used to give to english messies in whom it is extremely rare some person of genius untempered with mercy called him a curious dentatus and the nickname lasted as long as broderick lasted with his teeth and his knees and elbows sawing the air and his umbrella and his horse all ribs he was the delight of the row everybody liked him but everybody laughed at him in the end he renounced journalism and renounced politics and became warden of merton it was thought he would not be a good head of a college nor get on with his students but he falsified all predictions governed wisely and well won the affection of the boys under him and died lamented i suppose the explanation is that he had at bottom a genuine sincerity of nature but i am wandering far and i return to lady arthur and her house and her guests the form of salon which lady arthur russell preferred was a salon preceded by a dinner it was never a large dinner except in a few houses the banquets of forty or fifty people or more so dear to the new york hostess are not given in london nor is mere bigness reckoned an element of social success in the biggest capital of the world where society far exceeds in numbers the society of any other capital people are content with moderation a dinner of forty people is a lottery in which each guest has two chances and no more his luck and his hopes of being amused or interested depend wholly on his right and left hand neighbours lady arthur being by birth a frenchwoman had french ideas on this and other subjects she did not choose her guests alphabetically nor by rank nor for the sake of a passing notoriety lions you might meet at her house but they were not expected to roar nor did they neither at dinner nor after dinner were more people asked than could be managed large parties are of course given in london but they do not constitute a salon it is of the essence of a salon that people shall not be left wholly to themselves as in a large party they must be but shall be looked after affinities do not always find themselves they have to be brought together others have to be kept apart no authority is needed intuitions a quick eye for situations and a gentle skill in distribution are the gifts which go to the making of a good hostess these lady arthur had by mere smartness she set little store i suppose the house in audley square which lord arthur russell built never passed for a particularly smart house of houses which are called and which are smart there are scores in london of salon there are very few herself the daughter of a french viscount and with her husband brother to a duke lady arthur had no particular need to concern herself about mere smartness that is a reputation not altogether difficult to acquire the king's smile may confer it not perhaps the late queen's of whom one more than usually brilliant butterfly remarked but the queen you know never was in society 
which perhaps in the sense intended was true if there were one note more marked than another in these oddly square assemblies it was a note of culture ease and good breeding and distinction may all be taken for granted it is of the things which may not be taken for granted that i speak and culture certainly may not there are many houses in london in which it is neither expected nor desired in new york as we all know it is discouraged it would be discouraged anywhere if it were obtrusive or pedantic neither in a salon nor anywhere else is it to supersede good manners but to blend with them to make us alone possible there must be varied interest play of mind flexibility adaptability and an unlimited supply of tact perhaps the last includes all social gifts except those of the intellect it covers a multitude of deficiencies nay there was miss ada reeve a clever actress who last year was discussing on the stage questions of costume elsewhere than on the stage and announced if a woman has tact and diamonds she needs nothing else most of the generalities which you have been reading are really particulars and are descriptive of lady arthur russell's receptions of which i have spoken as a salon i don't know that lady arthur herself ever used the word nor does it matter the thing not the name is what matters there was culture of a very unusual kind on both sides of the house there was on lady arthur's side her french blood a salon in paris is no rare thing and the reason why it is not rare is because the society of paris is french in the faubourg saint germain if nowhere else the social traditions of the old monarchy in its most brilliant days still survive one of the noticeable things about this house in audley square was the presence of distinguished foreigners and another was that they seemed no longer to consider themselves foreigners they were at home nor was this true only of men and women of rank who might be of kin to the Pyrenees, and, at any rate, were of their world, but of artists and men of letters. I will take M. Renan as an example. He had come to London to deliver the Hibbert Lectures and a lecture on Marcus Aurelius before the Royal Institution in Albemarle Street, of which the ever-lamented Tyndale was then at the head. I had met Renan twice at other houses, he seemed a little dépassé. In Audley Square, this exotic and troubled air had disappeared. He had no English, at any rate he spoke none, and his conversation, or the conversation of the English with him, was therefore limited. But when he talked, and often when he did not, he was surrounded by a crowd of listeners, or, as the case might be, of lookers-on hence it was that he was so often kept or left standing and his physical frame was of such a kind that long standing was irksome to him and even painful i noticed one night that he seemed ill at ease and said to him i hoped he was not suffering yes he said that is exactly it i am souffrant and if i have to stand much longer i don't know what will happen but why don't you sit down oh do you think i might so i took him to a comfortable sofa and once seated an ineffable sweet peace stole over his features a more tragic incident happened in count von arnhem's case the end of whose career was all tragedy at this time he was still german ambassador in paris but prince bismarck had become distrustful of him and the end was not far off the public however knew nothing least of all the english public whose acquaintance with occurrences on the continent is apt to be remote for aught that was known in london count von arnhem was still the trusted representative of germany he bore a great name he held a great position the personal impression was a little disappointing he did not look like the man to stand up to prince bismarck who was a giant in stature as well as in character nor was he slight rather short lacking in distinction 
meagre in face with no hint of power in the shape of his head or in his rather furtive expression or in his carriage he seemed on the whole insignificant the eyes had no fire in them he looked older than his years and unequal to his renown it was the custom in those distant days to serve tea in the drawing-room after dinner count von arnhem was asked if he would take tea left the lady by whom he was sitting crossed the floor to the tea-table took his cup of tea from lady arthur's hand and started on his return the floor was of polished oak with here and there a rug just the sort of floor to which he must have been used to all his life but he slipped his feet flew from under him and down came the ambassador on his back it was an awful moment men went to his rescue he was helped up evidently much shaken and slowly found his way back to the sofa and to the lady who had been his companion there were almost tears in his eyes when a little later the news of his disgrace became known a man said well if he could not keep his feet in a drawing-room what chance had he against prince bismarck End of chapter forty chapter forty one of anglo-american memories by george washburn smalley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter forty one the archbishop of canterbury queen alexandra when the radical rages against the house of lords he commonly selects as the most deserving object of his wrath the lords spiritual wicked as the lords temporal are their episcopal comrades are more wicked still this is or was more peculiarly the nonconformist point of view a dissenter exists in order to hate a bishop he hates him as a rival in religion a successful rival he hates him as the visible sign of that social ascendancy of the church which is to the dissenter not less odious than its political and ecclesiastical primacy he hates him also because he is rich or is supposed to be so the archbishop of canterbury's fifteen thousand pounds a year his palace at lambeth and his old palace at canterbury are all alike to the true dissenter so many proofs of the devil's handiwork the archbishop of york is a sinner of less degree only because his devil's pension is less by five thousand pounds a year the bishop of london has the same salary as the archbishop of york and his iniquity though he is only a bishop is therefore the same there is then a descending scale of financial depravity beginning next after london with the bishop of durham at seven thousand pounds we come to the bishop of ely with five thousand five hundred pounds the bishops of oxford of bath and wells and salisbury with five thousand pounds each and so by easy stages of lessening vice to the pauper bishop of sodor and man who gets but a pittance of fifteen hundred pounds a year our dissenting friend waxes hotter as he reflects that one archbishop is paid three times as much as a prime minister and the other twice as much while three or four more bishops receive stipends larger than the present colleague of mr lloyd george and mr winston churchill these episcopal salaries are even higher than is that of mr lloyd george or that of mr winston churchill who has to be content himself with five thousand pounds a year while discharging not a few of the duties of the prime minister on the platform and if all reports be true in the cabinet itself this perhaps is rather incidental i was explaining why the dissenter hates the bishop the attitude of the bishops to the vital question of education augments the animosity of the dissenter their conservatism in general politics inflames their opponents still further to the nonconformist orator they are an unfailing target and he ought to be very much obliged to them for supplying him with ammunition but is not mr bright thundered against them and their adulterous origin mr bright's wrath whether rightly directed or not was in itself a noble thing 
the passion of a great soul greatly stirred just at present the bishops are a little less obnoxious to the radical than usual because they followed the radical lead on the licensing bill that bill evoked animosities not less bitter than the education bill the bishops made it a question of temperance holding that by higher licensing fees and heavier taxes on public houses and on liquor the consumption of spirits would be lessened they argued that if there were fewer public houses there would be fewer drinkers and drunkards they applauded mr asquith when he proposed that on sundays a man should walk six miles before he could have a glass of beer for that is what the bona fide traveller clause came to if they had the influence with their fellow peers they are supposed to have they could have prevented the rejection of the licensing bill but they could not do that then the radicals turned on them because they could not control a house where their very presence is to the radical a continuing offence the brewers are stronger than the bishops cried the radical to whose happiness a victim of one kind or another is essential the archbishop of canterbury led his brethren of the episcopal bench in this matter of temperance as he has led them on other matters he is their natural leader he is the primate of all england the head of the church next after the king his abilities and character are of a kind to fit him for leadership i suppose it may sound like a paradox if i suggest that for him who holds the highest ecclesiastical post in the land the first requisite is that he should be a man of the world but it is true and it is equally true of all bishops it was true of the late bishop potter who was not only the most eminent dignitary of the american episcopal church but almost the first citizen of new york the bishops have to administer each his own diocese and a diocese is a province they must understand how to govern they must understand men and so far as possible women they must be men of affairs whether they know much greek or hebrew is of quite secondary importance knowledge of that kind is ornamental the other kind is essential they ought to be diplomatists also skilled not so much in controversy as in avoiding controversy the present archbishop is all this his public career proves it and if you come to know him he will leave a very distinct personal impression on your mind it was my fortune to meet him at dalmany house not many years ago while he was still bishop of winchester his visit lasted some days and there have not been many days more interesting except for his clothes and perhaps for a certain sweetness of manner you need not have supposed him to be a bishop he did not talk shop he talked as others talk who are not of the church at once you saw he was broad-minded i do not use the word broad in its ecclesiastical sense there was not a suggestion of the apostolic or missionary attitude that was for another place and other circumstances nihil humani might have been his motto if he had a motto he talked well clearly picturesquely and in the tone which any guest in a country house might use he did not require you to remember that he was a bishop or even a priest he was just himself his knowledge and good sense and felicity of thought and speech were his own queen alexandra came to tea the archbishop as the rev randall davidson had been for eight years dean of windsor and naturally had seen much of the royal family i suppose i may say that he had in time become a trusted friend of the queen perhaps her most trusted adviser people who opposed his promotion called him a courtier as any man who lives much in the atmosphere of courts may be it was easy to see from the queen's manner how much she liked the bishop and looked to him for counsel if a point were a question it was to him she turned the princess victoria was with the queen and there too was a friendship those were days when affairs in the united states were in a critical state or seemed to be and when we were beginning to think that the good will of other countries might be important to us as it was and always will be 
as ours is to them so i hope i shall not do amiss if i repeat now a word which the queen then said to me i hope all the news from your own country is good we all hope that that expressed the queen's personal womanly sympathy and something more far gone were the days when english sympathies were for our enemies they are now for us and queen victoria was our friend and queen alexandra and the late king were our friends they shared the friendship of their people the queen spoke for herself and for them the bishop stood by her majesty's side as she said it his face brightened he knew as well as anybody how much it meant End of chapter 41Chapter 42 of Anglo-American Memories by George Washburn Smalley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 42. A Scottish Legend. Among the recollections of Scotland, which come thronging on from many other days, the supernatural always plays a part. I admit they are not easy to deal with. If you believe in ghosts or in legends, a great majority of your readers do not believe in you if you are a skeptic the credulous pass you by with an air of pain superiority if you neither believe nor disbelieve you are set down as an agnostic and there are great numbers of excellent people to whom the word agnostic implies reproach an agnostic however is not one who believes or disbelieves but who whatever his private conviction may be declines either to affirm or deny the truth of the matter in question but although an unbeliever i know of one story connecting itself with a famous legend which is so far as it goes absolutely true and this i'm going to tell exactly as it happened in eighteen eighty three i was staying at brecon castle with lord and lady dalhousie and lady dalhousie proposed one morning that we should drive over to cortachy castle to lunch brecon castle and cortachy castle are both in forfarshire and fourteen miles apart at that time cortachy castle was let to the late earl of dudley the seventh earl of arley to whom it belonged having lately died there's a tragic atmosphere for the eighth earl was killed at diamond hill in south africa in nineteen hundred one of the many men of rank and position and fortune and everything to live for who in the early disastrous days of the boer war gave up everything to fight for the flag and for their country and sovereign the family name is ogilvy and the family name and title are both old going back to at least fourteen ninety one they were ambassadors and great officers of state and the seventh lord ogilvy was made an earl two acts of attainder are testimony to the active part they took in those troubled times and to their capacity for holding fast to the losing side they were in the earl of mars rebellion in seventeen fifteen and fought for the pretender at culloden besides all that the ogilvies carried on for generations a feud with the campbells on both sides there were burnings and harryings and much shedding of blood there's no need to ask which of them was the more in fault the standards of those days were not as the standards of ours and there was a good deal less of that homage which vice now pays to virtue so it happened that one day early in the seventeenth century the ogilvies found themselves besieged at cortachy castle by the then earl of argyle or his lieutenant the besiegers sent in a herald with a drummer boy to demand the surrender of the castle the ogilvy people took the drummer boy and hanged him over the battlements his mother looking from the camp outside as the fashion was in those days she launched a curse or more than one at the ogilvies and a prophecy she foretold that whenever through all the ages to come death or disaster should visit them they would first hear the beating of the drum by the drummer boy such is the story as it was told to me it is a well-known tradition and you are told also that her prophecy has been strictly fulfilled 
the beating of the drum by the drummer boy has been heard at least once in each generation during the centuries that ever since then have witnessed the varying fortunes of this family that is a matter as to which i neither affirm nor deny how could i i was not there but the narrative is a necessary preface to the account of the day when the events i set out to describe did actually occur at luncheon lady dudley known then and still as the beautiful lady dudley told us that when lord hardwick one of the guests staying with them came down to breakfast that morning he asked her whether the drummer boy legend applied to the tenants of the castle for the time being or only to the ogilvies oh only to the ogilvies of course then you won't mind my telling you that i heard the drummer boy beating his drum last night and lady dudley added i did not mind in the least whether i believe in the menace or not i never heard that it had anything to do with anybody but the ogilvies if it could affect anybody in this case it would be lord hardwick who heard it and not us who did not hear it with which we naturally agreed we finished our lunch peacefully and pleasantly and at three o'clock lady dalhousie and i drove back to brecon castle where there were in all twelve guests we dined as usual at a quarter past eight and shortly before ten the ladies left the dining-room just after ten the door opened again lady dalhousie sailed in her face brilliant with excitement but her manner serene as usual and said to her husband dalhousie cordishy castle is burnt to the ground the dudleys are here and you must come at once at the drawing-room door stood lady dudley pale and beautiful and warned us that her husband knew as yet nothing of what had happened and asked us to be careful to say nothing which should alarm him he was at that time very ill and his mind was affected the rest of the evening after we went into the drawing-room passed without any mention of the disaster to cordetti lord dudley sat down to his rubber of whist won it and went to bed not knowing that the house in which he had expected to sleep had been destroyed by fire when he was told next morning he said very well and turned again to his newspaper the explanation was this after lady dalhousie and i left gortati lady dudley took her husband for a drive as usual as they were returning late they were stopped by a messenger who handed lady dudley a note from the factor saying the castle was on fire and there was no hope of saving it what is it asked lord dudley oh nothing much answered his wife the kitchen chimney has been on fire and the place is in a mess i think we had better drive over to brecon and ask the dalhousies to give us dinner this ready wit carried the day and saved lord dudley the shock which his wife dreaded but the whole company of guests at cortaki were also left homeless and they also came to brecon and slept there i never quite understood how for brecon castle can put up in a normal way fourteen people and we slept that night fifty-six but lady dalhousie besides being a reigning beauty had practical talents and managed it all as if an inundation of unexpected guests were an everyday affair there is one thing to be added past cortaki castle flows a shallow stream with a stony bed it was early in september the water was very low and what there was rippled and broke over the stones with a noise which at night and amid uncertain slumbers might easily be mistaken for the beating of a drum by a man whose mind was full of the drummer boy story after i had heard about lord hardwick at luncheon i had walked along the banks of this burn and the faint likeness of the waters beating on the stones to the beating of a drum occurred to me perhaps a mere fancy on my part i don't press it if anybody prefers to believe in the legend i don't ask him to believe in my conjecture by all means let him nourish his own faith in his own way he may like to know moreover that lord hardwick now dead was one of the last persons in the world to conceive or cherish an illusion 
a well-known man of the world in his own way a celebrity if only known for his hats which were the glossiest ever seen outside of the stock exchange he had gone the pace climbed outside of every stick of property he possessed said one of his friends and had acquired a vast and varied stock of experience in the process on the face of it not at all the kind of man to believe too much nor to believe in anything as was said of mr low which he could not bite he came into the dining-room that night at brecon and stayed on the next day among lady dalhousie's guests was mr huxley certainly a man of the world was mr huxley but of a different world from lord hardwick's they had never met you might have said they had not a subject in common but they talked to each other and to the surprise of the company it presently became evident that they got on together i said as much to mr huxley afterward he answered in his decisive way don't make any mistake lord hardwick's has power of mind for which even his own set so far as i know has never given him credit we did not talk about the weather he was a man who would put his mind to yours no matter what you talked about and it would take you all your time to keep up with him years afterward i reminded mr huxley of this and asked him had he ever met lord hardwick again no and never and i regret it but we did not move quite in the same orbits i have hardly seen anybody since who made such an impression on me it's not a question of orbits it's a question of men i asked lord hardwick about the same time whether he remembered meeting mr huxley remember how many huxleys are there in the world that you should suppose i could forget this one it is of the distinction of english life in general and of london to which new york will perhaps some day attain that sooner or later it brings together men and women each of the first rank in his or her own department and each unlike the other they have long understood here that a society which is not various ends in monotony and of all forms of dullness that is the dullest End of chapter 42of anglo-american memories by george washburn smalley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter forty three a personal reminiscence of the late emperor frederick it used to be said that english sympathies were given to austria and not to prussia in the war of eighteen sixty six because the austrian railway officials were so much more polite than the prussian of the fact that the english wished austria and not prussia to win there is no doubt the railway question was perhaps a reason if not the reason the organization of prussia was at that time as the organization of germany civil and military now is the finest in the world but flexibility is not one of its merits still less is it distinguished by consideration for the rights of the non-military and non-official german world the english were then as now a travelling people and their authority if i may use such a word on the continent was greater or seemed greater then than now because the competition was less americans had not then begun to swarm across the atlantic as tourists nor was the american language heard on every hillside of the tyrol and on the battlefields of silesia it was all english and the english beyond question found austria a more agreeable pleasure ground than the wind-swept plateaus of her grim neighbour to the north in those days and for many years to come the english had taken and kept possession of hamburg the pretty watering-place near frankfort as in so many other matters the fashion was set by the late king then prince of wales whom his fellow subjects and presently not a few americans followed in a loyal spirit they followed him not less loyally when he forsook hamburg and journeyed further afield to marienbad for the truth is the germans and especially the north germans had rediscovered hamburg and the streets where for so many years the english accent had been heard and almost no other grew suddenly hoarse with teutonic gutturals 
I don't say that this invasion drove him elsewhere. He was himself as much German as English. But when his yearly visits in August ceased, the English surrendered Hamburg to its real owners, albeit they rather resented what they called their usurpation. There was, however, one English woman who clung to it, the Empress Frederick, the late king's eldest sister and princess royal of the United Kingdom. Her royal highness had married the crown prince of Prussia, afterward the emperor Frederick, in 1858, being then just over seventeen years of age. For many years she spent part of each summer in the old Schloss, just outside the little town, then later built herself a showy villa on the other flank, and died there in August 1901. I don't think the late king had ever revisited Hamburg after that date. She liked the place, liked its pure air, its scenery, the hills and woods amid which it lay embosomed, its pleasant walks and the pleasant life its visitors led, and some of its residents, though, except the princess herself and the hotel keepers and the garrison for the time being, I hardly know who the residents were. It was, moreover, a great resort of invalids who were not ill enough to be sent to a serious cure. Many a doctor in London and elsewhere had for a maxim, when in doubt, choose Homburg. Its waters could do you no harm, its climate was sure to do you good, and its animation, its gaiety, its brilliancy even, during the six-week season, were all so many tonics for the malade imaginaire. Such acquaintance as I had with the crown princess, I owed to the late king, who one day asked me if I knew his sister. When I said no, he answered, Oh, but you should, I must arrange it and proposed that I should come to tea the next afternoon at his villa, then the Villa Imperiale, when the Crown Princess would be there. Arriving, I found myself the only guest. I was presented to the Princess. In figure, in face and manner, she was very like her mother, the late Queen. The figure was not so stout, the face not so rubicund, the manner less simple, and therefore with less authority, but the resemblance in each particular was marked. There was even a resemblance in dress, or it might be truer to say that both the late queen and her eldest daughter showed an indifference to the art of personal adornment. Certain terms have become stereotyped in various worlds of art. Early Victorian, Mid-Victorian, or merely Victorian, are these labels now used by way of compliment or even of mere description? I am afraid they are one and all terms of disparagement. But it was said truly of the late queen that it did not matter what she wore. Robes did not make the queen. Whatever she wore, she was queen and looked the queen. The princess had, however, a much greater vivacity than her mother. At moments it became restlessness, and the mind, I thought, could never be in repose. There was no beauty, but there was distinction, and in this again she resembled the queen. After her marriage, and down to the day when the Emperor Frederick's death extinguished her ambitions, the princess had lived in a dream world of her own creation, of which I will say more in a moment. Her beliefs were so strong, her conviction that she knew what was best for those about her was so complete, that to these beliefs and this conviction the facts had to adjust themselves as best they could. Even for the purpose of this audience that necessity became evident. I had been presented, of course, as an American. Almost at once Her Royal Highness plunged into American affairs. She was keenly interested in educational and social problems, and explained to me the position of women in the United States with reference to these problems. It appeared she had a correspondent in Chicago, as I understood, a lady who had been presented to Her Royal Highness in Berlin, and from this lady had derived a whole budget of impressions. They were extremely interesting, if only because they were, to me, altogether novel but as I was not asked to confirm them, I, of course, said nothing. Now and then a question was put, which I answered as well as I could, 
but for the most part the princess's talk flowed on smoothly and swiftly during the better part of an hour she talked with clearness with energy with an almost apostolic fervour the voice penetrating rather than melodious i said to myself all this may be true of chicago but of what else is it true the princess had indeed given chicago as the source of her information but it seemed to me that she generalized from the windy city to the rest of the united states and of such part as i knew i did not think it a good account after a time chicago was dismissed and the talk drifted away into less difficult channels but the position was always much the same the princess talked and i listened the most interesting of all positions i had heard everybody had heard a great deal about her views on politics and on anglo-german relations and on the internal affairs of germany on some of these matters she touched briefly on all she threw a bright light for no matter what the immediate topic of her discourse her attitude of mind toward other topics and toward higher matters of state became visible never for a moment did this stream of talk stop or grow sluggish carlyle summed up macaulay for whom he had no great respect in the phrase flow on thou shining river he might in a sardonic mood have done the same for this princess after a time i found myself in a dilemma an hour and a half had passed agreeably and brilliantly but it had passed and i had been for some time expecting the signal which would indicate that my audience was at an end it did not come the princess talked on i knew her royal highness had a dinner engagement and i knew i had and it was already half past six and hamburg dinners are early finally i said i was afraid i had abused her royal highness's kindness and might i be permitted to withdraw the permission was given the princess held out her hand and i went it was an illuminating interview it threw light on events to come as well as on those of the past here was a great lady full of intelligence and gifts yet taking views of great public questions which she held almost alone she had made many enemies she was to make many more in berlin i had heard much prince bismarck's distrust of the crown princess and of the crown prince on her account was known it was shared by multitudes of germans they believed rightly or wrongly that she wanted to anglicize germany her ascendancy over her husband was believed to be complete and because it was complete the day of the crown prince's accession to the throne was expected with dread during his short reign of three months march ninth to june fifteenth eighteen eighty eight these gloomy forecasts could be neither confirmed nor dispelled but they existed they were general and they modified the grief of the german people at the melancholy ending of what had promised to be a great career i suppose it must be said that the crown princess had furnished some material for german forebodings as to a german future shaped by her or by her influence she talked openly she told all comers that what germany needed was parliamentary government as it was understood and practiced in england against that the german face was set as flint in little things as in great she made no secret of her preference for what was english over what was german when the rooms the crown prince and crown princess were to occupy in the palace of Karlottenburg outside berlin were to be refurnished she insisted on bringing upholsterers from london to do the work naturally the berlin people did not like that judgment was not her strong point nor was tact if i am to say what was her strong point i suppose it would be sincerity her gifts of mind were dazzling rather than sound her impulses were not always under control her animosities once roused never slept as prince bismarck well knew her will was so vehement as sometimes to obscure her perceptions 
but hers was a loyal nature and whatever one may think of her politics it is impossible not to regret that the promise of a great ambition should have come to so tragic an end end of chapter forty three Chapter 44 of Anglo-American Memories by George Washburn Smalley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 44. Edward the Seventh as Prince of Wales. 1. Personal Incidents. Everything, or almost everything, has been said about King Edward the Seventh, every tribute paid him from every quarter of the world, and the mourning of his people is the best tribute of all. I should like to add an estimate from a different point of view and a tribute, but I suppose they would have no proper place in these papers, and I confine myself, therefore, to memories. I will go back to the period when he was Prince of Wales, and to the place where he put off most of the splendors belonging to his rank, and where most of the man himself was to be seen, not once nor twice, but for years in succession." Hamburg was to the Prince of Wales a three weeks holiday. I do not think he took the medical side of it very seriously. He drank the waters and walked, as the doctors bade him, but with respect to diet he seemed to be his own doctor, and his prescriptions were not severe. But then nobody, the local physicians excepted, ever did take Hamburg very seriously as a cure. What the prince liked was the freedom of which he was himself the author. On occasions of ceremony and in the general course of his life at home, strict etiquette was enforced. At Hamburg, the prince used his dispensing power and put aside everything but the essentials. He lived in a hired villa. He wore lounging suits in the daytime, sometimes of a rather flamboyant color, and a soft gray hat. In the evening, a black dining jacket, black tie, black waistcoat, black trousers, and a soft black Hamburg hat. The silk hat and the dress coat and white tie or white waistcoat were unknown. Most of the officers of his household were left at home, but General Sir Stanley Clark was always with him. His way of life was as informal as his dress. He was there to amuse himself, and it was an art he understood perfectly. Hamburg is a village, but it had, or had at that time, many resources. The three or four streets of which the place consisted were so many rendezvous for the visitors. The lawn tennis grounds were another. The walks in the woods were delightful. There were drives over the hills and far away, in the purest air in Germany. If you tired of the little watering place or its guests, there was Frankfurt, only eight miles distant, with resources of a more varied kind. But in Hamburg itself, the Kursaal, though there had been no gambling since 1869, and the hotels were always open and sometimes lively. What the prince liked was society in one form or another. The open-air life suited him. It was sufficiently formal, but less formal than indoors. He liked strolling about and meeting acquaintances or friends. When you had once seen His Royal Highness leaning against the railings of a villa, the villa stood each in its own ground, and talking to a lady leaning out of the first-floor window, and this interview lasting a quarter of an hour, you felt that the conditions of life and the relations of royalty to other ranks in life had taken on a quite new shape in Hamburg but the attitude of respect was maintained. Certain formalities were never forgotten. The prince was always addressed as Sir or as Your Royal Highness, but these observances were not irksome, nor was conversation restricted or stiffened by the obligations of deference or by the accepted conventionalities, which, after all, were more matters of form than of substance and in his most careless moods the prince had a dignity which was the more impressive for being apparently unconscious nobody ever forgot what was due to him or ever forgot it twice it was an offence he did not pardon or pardoned only in those who could not remember what they had never known a foreigner an american who erred in pure ignorance might count on forgiveness 
the prince gave many luncheons and dinners almost always at ritter's or at the cursal i should think there was never a day when he did not play the host the dinners at the cursal were given on the terrace always crowded with other dinner parties at ritter's they were on the piazza this open-air hospitality was the pleasanter because it was so seldom possible in england he had brought the art of entertaining to perfection he put his guests even those who stood most in awe of royalty at their ease the costume perhaps helped when a company of people were in dining jackets and the men wearing their soft black hats even at table by the prince's command etiquette became a less formidable thing the prince talked easily fluently and well he might ask a guest whom he liked to sit next him ignoring distinctions of rank but during the dinner he would talk sooner or later to everybody there might be a dozen guests a number seldom exceeded i will give you one example of the dialogue which went on and no more the late duke of devonshire at that time the marquis of hartington was sitting nearly opposite the prince but at some distance and this colloquy took place hartington you ought not to be drinking all that champagne no sir i know i oughtn't then why do you do it well sir i've made up my mind that i'd rather be ill now and then than always taking care of myself oh you think that now but when the gout comes what do you think then sir if you will ask me then i will tell you i do not anticipate the prince laughed and everybody laughed and lord hartington for all his gout lived to be seventy-four one of the truest englishmen of his time or of any time among the americans who were presented to the prince at homburg were mr depew and mark twain i was not in homburg when mr depew first came but i asked one of the prince's equerries to arrange the presentation of mr depew and i wrote to lady cork begging her to do what she could for him so the formalities were duly transacted the prince took a liking to the american asked him to dine put him on his right hand and listened to his stories with delight he told me afterward that depew was a new experience he asked him again and again and the next year also i believe several years or as long as depew went to homburg the prince said depew's stories were not all good but he told the bad ones so well that they were better than the good my letter to lady cork had a fate i did not foresee though i ought to have foreseen when she told the prince that i had written her about depew she had my manuscript in her hand is that smalley's letter may i see it asked the prince took it and read the whole it happened that i was staying at the time with one of her married daughters and there was a deal good of family gossip in the letter when the prince handed it back there was in his eyes a gleam of that humour so often seen there and he said now i know some of the things i've been wanting to know and lady cork answered sir we have nothing to conceal from your royal highness there was of course an intimacy which put the prince on his honour mark twain was staying at nauheim some twelve miles away he had driven into hamburg and was wandering about the place when he was pointed out to the prince and was presented mark twain had at the time no very great care about his personal appearance and was very shabbily dressed he was the tramp abroad at first i didn't think he much interested the prince his slowness of speech and his unusual intonations were not altogether prepossessing however when he had taken his leave the prince seemed to think he wished to see him again and said i should like to ask him to dinner do you think he has a dining jacket the risk whatever it might be was taken the invitation was sent and mark came to dinner dining jacket and all but he did not care to adapt himself to the circumstances considering perhaps that the circumstances ought to adapt themselves to him the meeting was not a great success and so far as i know was never repeated socially speaking the mississippi pilot was an intransigeant at times and this was one of the times he could not i suppose overcome his drawling manner of speech nor reduce his interminable stories to dinner-table limits 
He had the air of usurping more than his share of the conversation and of the time, which he certainly did not mean to. Intentions, unluckily, count for little. Men are judged by what they do, and the general impression was not as favorable to Mark on this occasion as it might have been if he had been better known. Among all princes and potentates, there was never one more willing to make allowances or less exacting in respect to trivial matters than Mark's host. But after all, he was Prince of Wales and the future King of England, and if you were not prepared to recognize that, it was open to you to stay away. Mark Twain, at any rate, was not one of the Americans who followed the Prince to Hamburg. He met the prince almost by accident, and returned from Nauheim by the prince's invitation for this not very successful dinner. His republicanism was perhaps of a rebellious kind, and possibly, though without desiring to, he gave the prince to understand as much. Some of Mark's compatriots went far in the opposite direction, especially one or two American women. There was a handsome American girl who had found means to be presented to the prince. No difficult matter for a pretty woman at any time. Then she sent him a photograph of himself and begged him to sign it. As I was passing the prince one afternoon in the street, he stopped me and pulled a parcel out of his pocket, saying, This is a photograph Miss X sent me to sign, and I have signed it, and I was just going to leave it for her at the hotel, but I am afraid to. I don't know what she may not ask me next. Would you mind leaving it for me? The prince did not see, but as I went on, I saw, on the porch, the girl herself. She must have looked on at what happened, and I'm not at all sure she did not hear what the prince said. Nonetheless, she accepted the signed photograph joyfully, and it always had a place of honor in New York. "'Wasn't it kind of His Royal Highness to give it to me?' queried this beautiful being, not knowing that the true story had been told me. When I made my report to the prince, I remarked casually that Miss X had been sitting on the veranda and might have seen what took place. "'I hope she heard also,' exclaimed the prince. But he did not quite mean that. At any rate, he relented afterward, and was seen to be talking to the girl, whose eyes he could not but admire. 2. Prince of Wales and King of England, the personal side. I need not say much about the public life of the late king, nor about the part he played in the empire of the world, but there are certain passages in his private life and in his relations with the late queen which had an effect on his career, and may be related in whole or in part. The greatness of this reign is the more remarkable because experience of public affairs came to the king late in life. He was in his sixtieth year when he came to the throne, and during the forty years when he might have been acquiring invaluable experience, he had been sedulously excluded by the late queen from all share in the business of state so much is known and so much is sometimes stated in the english press though stated with caution it is the truth but it is not all the truth i believe it to be also true that after the death of the prince consort in eighteen sixty one the queen desired the prince of wales to take up some portion of the duties of his father and offered him a place as her private secretary the prince for whatever reason declined it he was not much over twenty years of age, and never in any man, perhaps, was the desire of la joie de vivre stronger. Some years later, a truer sense of his position and duties and opportunities came to him. He offered to accept, and besought the Queen's permission to accept, the post she had first offered him. Her Majesty made answer that the post had been filled, and never from that time onward did she open to the Prince of Wales the door she had then closed. She left him to amuse himself, to choose his own associates, and his own occupations. She herself spent six hours a day, never less and often much more, in reading dispatches and state papers of all kinds. The Prince saw none of them, was present at no interviews with ministers, knew nothing at first hand of the conduct of affairs. 
yet the prince had in the face of these discouragements an appetite for public business he was well informed about it but only as an outsider is well informed naturally the opinion had grown up that not much was to be expected of the prince as king the death of the late queen was thought to close an era it had not occurred to any one except perhaps to his nearest friends to think of the new king as well equipped for his kingship true lord salisbury than whom there could be no higher authority speaking in the house of lords had said of the new king upon his accession that he had a profound knowledge of the working of our constitution and conduct of our affairs lord salisbury had had his exceptional means of knowing and he expressed his own opinion a true opinion but not a general opinion i suppose lord rosebery long intimate with the prince might have said as much but to most men such expressions came as a surprise i met sir francis jeune at dinner on the evening after the first privy council held by the king which sir francis had gone down to osborne to attend he began at once to describe the scene the king astonished us all we had all known him as prince of wales it became clear we had yet to know him as king his air of authority sat on him as if he had worn it always he spoke with weight as a king should speak it was plain he had come to the throne to rule ask the ministers and other great personages who stood to him in official relations mr asquith has answered for them all i speak from a privileged and close experience when i say that whatever he was or whatever may have been his apparent preoccupations in the transaction of the business of the state there were never any arrears there was never any trace of confusion there was never any moment of avoidable delay in the opinion of the king their time and his belonged to the public and neither was to be wasted the whole truth about the late king's mission to paris has i think never been told it was not expedient that it should be told at the time nor was it generally known but until it is known full justice cannot be done to the king's courage and wisdom or to his direct personal influence on the course of great affairs for it was the man himself the king himself who won this great victory not by diplomacy not by statecraft but because he was the man he was i tell the story briefly but the outlines will be enough when the king went to paris to lay the foundations of a new friendship between france and england the feeling of the french against the english ran high they had not forgotten nor forgiven the sympathies of england with germany in eighteen seventy they had not forgotten their own retreat from egypt in eighteen eighty two and they scored up their own mistake against england they had not forgotten fashoda the king was warned not to go the french government warned him they could protect him they said against violence but not against insult his own government thought his visit in the circumstances ill-advised against all this he said his own conviction that the moment had come to make an effort for a better understanding between the two peoples danger did not deter him for personal danger he cared nothing, and against the danger that any discourtesy to himself might embitter the two nations, he set the hope of success. Like the statesman he was, he calculated forces and calculated wisely. He knew that the French, and especially the Parisians, had always liked him personally, and he resolved to risk it. Neither his courage nor his sagacity was at fault at first things went badly when he reached the railway station he was received in silence when he drove from the station to the embassy there was not a cheer as he went about paris the next day the attitude of the parisians was still sullen if not hostile but the presence and personality of the king began after a time to soften hardness before nightfall a cheer or two had been heard in the streets and next day all paris was once more all smiles and applause the king had conquered he had won over the people he had convinced ministers he had conciliated public opinion he had laid a gentle hand upon old 
and still open wounds he had shown himself for the first time a great instrument and messenger of peace and had begun the work to which all the rest of his life was to be devoted long before that ever memorable visit in france as in england the prince knew all sorts of people and was popular with all and did not mind being of service now and then to the people whom he did not know at all dining one night with the duc de la rochefoucauld bassacia in the faubourg saint germain he was asked by his host to go with him to the opening reception at the house of a banker in the boulevard houseman the banker had made a great fortune and had great social ambitions the prince knew very well why he was asked but good-naturedly went his going was chronicled and blazoned next day in every one of the seventy daily papers of paris and the banker's ambition was satisfied that was one incident another was his presence of course in the prince of wales period at a supper given by the figaro in its new offices celebrities of all sorts were there and the prince had to sit still while a too well-known actress from the booth proposed the queen's health he raised his glass drank the toast and said nothing it was no fault of his this also found its way into the french papers not into the english he had many friendships among artists men of letters soldiers statesmen between the prince and the late marquis de guefe the marshal ney of this last generation there was a close tie two chivalrous souls who understood each other from the beginning he was often to be seen in studios m de Talliers, m rodin's and many others he knew the theatre in paris as well as he knew the theatres in london perhaps better he went to the theatre primarily i think to be amused and the theatre in paris are more amusing than the theatres in london the most patriotic englishman may be content to admit that if the prince had any politics abroad they were kept for his private use to the french republic as republic and to successive presidents of the republic he showed nothing but good will to french statesmen the same to gambetta to walbeck rousseau to m clemenceau whose originalities and courage interested him long before that energetic individuality had become prime minister they all liked the prince but not one of them ever guessed that from him when king would spring the new impulse of friendship which was to make france and england in all but name allies and so impose peace upon the restless ambition of another great sovereign gambetta it is true foretold a splendid future for the prince without explaining how it was to be splendid i think if you moved about among englishmen one thing would impress you more than all others in their tributes to their late king not their full testimony to his greatness of king nor their admiration of his capacities nor their pride in him as a ruler not their sense of the incalculable services he had rendered not their gratitude for these services deep as that is not the imperial spirit and the new value they set upon the unity of the empire not his virtues of any kind though to all of them they bear witness the one thing which would impress you beyond all this is the affection they bore to him in his lifetime and now bear to his memory he had known how to establish new relations between king and people relations which had a tenderness and a beauty unknown before they belonged to an earlier period of history they were not quite patriarchal as in really ancient days but were like the relations which exist in an old family ties of blood and of long descent they did not exist in the last reign there was immense respect for queen victoria not much sentiment she had withdrawn herself too much from general intercourse and even from the ceremonial part of her royal duties but this king her son went among the people lived among them lived for them gave them his constant thought won their hearts his loss is to them a personal loss they mourn for him as for a king and they mourn for him as for a friend who is gone 
that seems to me the finest tribute of all three as king some personal and social incidents and impressions i met at luncheon one of the king's friends in some ways one among the most intimate of the innumerable friends he had a man however not readily yielding to emotion nor likely to take what is called the sentimental view we began to talk of the king suddenly he broke off i cannot say much i loved him i don't know that i can tell you anything more characteristic or illuminating than that it is the kind of tribute the king himself would have liked and there are millions of englishmen to-day whose hearts are full of the same feeling the king, the late king, was a great master of kingly graces. He knew, I suppose, more men and women than any man of his time. He knew the exact degree of consideration to which each one of them was entitled, and exactly how to express it. If you desire to form to yourself a conception of the interval which divides a king, with the inherited traditions of a thousand years, from the elected chief magistrate of yesterday, you might do worse than watch the ceremonial customs of personal intercourse we know what the indiscriminate handshakings by the president are we know that the custom aided by the incredible stupidity of the police about him cost one of them his life we read the other day that a president after enduring this exaction for a time had to stop it his right hand was all but paralyzed we have all listened to the presidential i'm very glad to see you repeated to all comers it may be unavoidable but it all detracts something from the dignity of the office and the man this king who is gone gave his hand more often than any other but at his own choice and discretion it was thought abroad he went great lengths and some of the continental sovereigns and the courtiers about them criticized him they also after a time imitated him and sometimes at once the present german emperor was one of those who took the hint from his uncle as soon as it was given i told long ago how the emperor and the then prince of wales in eighteen eighty nine came on board the white star steamship teutonic lying at spithead with a great company of naval guests there to witness the great naval review which never took place the first lord of the admiralty mr chamberlain lord charles beersford mr ismay mr depew and many other persons of distinction were grouped on the main deck the emperor came up the steps first and by way of acknowledging their salutations raised his white cap the prince of wales shook hands with all those i have named and with some others the emperor looking on astonished then came a prolonged inspection of the teutonic the finest passenger ship then afloat the pioneer of all modern comfort and splendor on the atlantic mr ismay's creation there had been much talk in which emperor and prince had both taken part and by the time they were ready to leave the great german sovereign had learned his lesson he shook hands cordially with mr ismay in whom he had recognized a kindred spirit of greatness other than his own but not less genuine and with others the faces of his staff were the faces of men amazed perplexed almost incredulous at drawing-rooms and courts and levees in private houses where he was a guest whether in town or country on the turf in the theatre at a public ceremonial at a marlborough house or windsor garden party the same habit prevailed prince of wales or king of england he met his friends as a friend and for acquaintances with any title to recognition he had a pleasant welcome it added immensely to his popularity among those who knew him and among the millions who never saw him but heard they thought of him as a man among men which he was in every sense and as one who thought manhood an honourable thing ask moreover any of the equerries or others of his household they will all tell you he was considerate he expected each officer to do his duty and it was done it is often an irksome duty but he made it needlessly so the human side of him was never long hidden 
it is a remark one is tempted to repeat again and again it came out in the services he was forever doing public in their nature but from a private impulse he met to the full the expectation of the public and discharged to the full the obligation of the crown in respect of all charities and ceremonials and always with a kindly grace which made his presence and his gifts doubly welcome with people whom he knew well and liked he was glad to lay aside etiquette i could give you but must not the names of friends to whom he would often send word in the afternoon that he was coming to dine that evening and to play bridge after even a king and a great king must sometimes relax he cannot always appear in armour his hostess would meet him at the door with a curtsy and then welcome him as a friend and the talk all through dinner was intimate and free those were delightful hours so were the days in country houses where the king was a guest always no doubt a certain hush in the atmosphere a certain constraint if the party was large but so far as the king was concerned if people were not at their ease it was their own fault everybody knew where the line was drawn nobody in his senses overpassed it one flagrant instance there was not in the country but at a house in london at supper a large party the hour grew late and the prince still sat at his table a guest who had found the champagne to his liking staggered across the room steadied himself by a chair and stuttered out i don't know whether your royal highness knows how late it is but it's past two o'clock and i'm going home good night sir the prince sat still and answered not he saw the man's condition nobody knew better the rule that such a company did not break up till the prince gave the signal he was a man with a great social position and not social only when he had departed the prince finished his interrupted sentence and the talk went on as before not an allusion to the offence or the offender his sense of social responsibility showed itself in an unexpected form during the boer war there grew up among the aristocracy a passionate patriotism which sent heads of great families and elder and younger sons into the field the king thought this feeling threatened to have grave consequences he approved it of course and encouraged it but he thought limits ought to be set to a fervour which seemed not unlikely to extinguish an important part of the nobility he sent for a number of men in great position who had resolved to go and advised them to wait saying with his usual good sense enough men of your class have gone already to show your devotion more than are really needed for the purpose of war wait a little if matters go badly it will be time enough then for you to depart one secret of the extraordinary social power of both prince and king lay in his knowledge of social matters nobody was so well informed he had about him numbers of men and of women who took pains to send him or bring him the earliest account of any social incident or gossip it was known that he had these sources of information and that whatever was known to any one was known to him such knowledge as that was a weapon it was not one of which he made use or needed to use the fact that he had it was enough he liked news also and took pains to get it if there were a political or ministerial crisis you might be sure that marlborough house knew all about it he had a certain number of men in his suite or of his acquaintance from whom he expected and generally got early intelligence there was a sort of competition in supplying him if you were first you were thanked if you had been anticipated he remarked dryly and with a good-humoured twinkle in his very expressive eyes oh yes very interesting uh, but i heard it an hour ago when i was leaving england in eighteen ninety five for america the prince gave me his cipher address and asked me to cable him as often as there was news i thought might interest him that may also serve to show us americans how much he cared for american matters and how completely he returned the good will we have always borne him since his visit to the united states in eighteen sixty 
i told the prince my first duty was to the times since i was going home as their correspondent subject to that i should be glad to send him what i could the difference of time was such that he might well enough get a dispatch before midnight at marlborough house which could not appear in print till next morning but you know that's just what i should like said the prince from beginning to end the late king has lived his life ever a full life possibly not always a wise life who can be wise always who likes a man who is always wise his faults in youth were of a kind which were recognized as belonging to men the blood which flowed in his veins came down to him through centuries of ancestors to whom the restrictions and pudencies often hypocritical of modern days were unknown and if we look at the result at the crown of all at the matured character which made him one of the greatest servants of the state of any state ever known in history need there be any criticism or any regret not perhaps the white flower of a blameless life but was there ever one but a great human life compact of good and ill and so flowering into the greatness of a great king perhaps the best summary is pascal's qu'une vie est heureuse quand elle commence pour l'amour et qu'elle finit par l'ambition for the king's ambition was never for himself he had no need to wish to be other than he was it was an ambition for the good of his people End of chapter 44 End of Anglo-American Memories by George Washburn Smalley